Imagine a gaping maw that could swallow you whole. Not just you, but any creature of any size. Imagine a creature capable of constant transformation and evolution, taking any traits it needs from its prey. It is indestructible, intelligent, unstoppable. The perfect organism. And would you believe me if I told you? It was downright adorable. A little boy wanders through a toy store, a small wad of money in hand, searching for the perfect thing to play with. Desperate to help quell some of his summer vacation boredom, his parents gave him a little cash and brought him to the store to pick out a new distraction. But what will he choose? A superhero action figure? A toy car? Some brightly colored plastic bricks to build with? None of it seems quite right. The truth is, he doesn't really want a toy so much as he wants someone to play with. But his parents don't get the summer off like he does, and they don't have the time to entertain him in between the seemingly endless meetings and phone calls. He's just about to give up and tell his parents that there isn't anything he wants when he suddenly spots a friendly, plush face peering out from between a few remote control trucks. He reaches out his hand to touch the soft fabric, only for the toy's face to meet his hand halfway. Toddles off of the shelf on short little legs, bumping its head against the boy's hand like a cat asking for pets. The boy grants the toy's request, patting it gently on the head, and it emits a high-pitched sound like a little meow, crawling closer and pressing itself against his leg affectionately. The boy beams, scarcely able to believe his luck. This isn't a toy at all. It's a new friend. There isn't a price tag on the soft creature or a barcode that a cashier could scan. Is he supposed to pay for it? Anxious about the possibility of doing something wrong, but even more afraid that he won't get to bring his new friend home after all, he places the money on the shelf where the creature came from, then scoops it into his arms. Delighted to be held, it falls into a peaceful sleep, and by the time the boy rejoins his parents at the front of the store, it looks to them as if he bought himself an ordinary plush toy. It isn't the most adventurous pick by any means, but they haven't seen him this happy in a while, so they don't ask any further questions. That is, until it starts to move of its own free will. Immediately, the boy's screaming mother starts chasing the impossible creature with a broom. It gives a desperate meep and tries to avoid her onslaught, but its four little legs can only carry it so far. It needs some kind of boost to escape, and luckily, it finds one, in the form of a dead cockroach lying underneath the kitchen table. The plush creature's thin mouth expands, swallowing the dead cockroach whole. Immediately, two extra legs, giving it a total of six, grow out of the creature's flank. Six legs, yes, that's more like it. It scuttles away at great speed, chasing its way up the wall as the boy's mother screams in horror. But that won't dissuade the father. He's taken up his double-barreled shotgun and unloads two slugs into the creature. The force knocks it off the wall, making it tumble to the ground. But despite taking the brute force of a powerful shotgun, it somehow still lives. It skitters away at full speed as the father, loading two more slugs, gives chase. It escapes through the doggy door, the father and his screaming wife hot on its heels. Luckily for the creature, there's another boon just outside the house, a dead pigeon that had met its demise in an unfortunate collision with the living room window a few hours earlier. The creature doesn't waste any time. Its impossibly elastic mouth stretches open and swallows the pigeon whole, the decaying bird disappearing into the darkness. As soon as the creature's mouth closes, it starts to change again. Its extra legs disappear, and it begins to take on a more bird-like shape, with wings and tail feathers that help it take flight. The door swings open, and the creature swoops into the air. Not to be deterred or dishonored, the father levels his shotgun again and takes aim. Boom! The blast hits the now-flying creature again, sending it spinning through the air with a high-pitched squeak. It doesn't understand why these people are being so mean to it after it was allowed so warmly into their home not long ago. Despite being shot with a shotgun, twice, it is still unharmed, just a little shocked. When it lands, it does so on the side of a wooded road to catch its breath. All that flying worked up a powerful hunger, and luckily for the creature, there's a nearly intact deer carcass laying on the grassy verge nearby. Not long before, it had been sent on an express trip to the afterlife by the grill of an SUV. Waste not, want not, the creature thinks. The creature's mouth expands and devours the deer, despite the deer being several times its own size. Once the less than fortunate fawn has been consumed, the creature sprouts four long, majestic legs and a little cotton tail before galloping off into the woods. 
No, don't worry, you haven't completely lost your mind. You've just witnessed SCP-4966 in the wild. And if that story was a little too much for you, I regret to inform you that this case file gets far, far stranger from there. SCP-4966 is a quadrupedal stuffed animal constructed from grey fabric. It also just so happens to be alive. Any attempts to pierce this fabric and examine the creature's contents have failed. It appears to be essentially indestructible. After dissection failed, the Foundation attempted to examine the internal structures of SCP-4966's body using X-rays, but it seemed to show a complete lack of skeleton or musculature, or anything else that would allow the creature to move as it does. Aside from two black eyes and a woven mouth, SCP-4966 has no visible markings or orifices on its body. Its vocalizations resemble that of a kitten, and its disposition is highly social. If it does not receive socialization on a regular basis, the creature will become anxious and withdrawn. Just as cats are known for mirroring the behavior of the fellow felines and human owners, SCP-4966 will imitate the actions of other entities it spends time with. It does not appear to need food, water, or air, but will eat, drink, and breathe if in the presence of an entity doing the same. There is, however, one scenario in which SCP-4966 will eat regardless of the behavior of other entities in the area. When the creature is presented with the corpse of an organism, it will extend its mouth to an anomalous degree and consume the body whole. The creature's body will bulge and stretch around its meal, but the density of its plush skin remains the same throughout the process. There appears to be no size limit on the corpses it can consume, as the creature was once witnessed consuming an adult blue whale's body during one particularly ambitious test. Once SCP-4966 has completely enveloped a given corpse, its body will slowly return to its original size. During this transition phase, the creature will display changes to its morphology, consistent with the characteristics of its most recent meal. These alterations vary widely, but the existing facial features and grey coloration will always remain unchanged. This process goes on for approximately four hours, at which point the creature will regurgitate some manner of biological waste composed of various elements of the original organism. If this process is hard for you to wrap your head around, I can relate. Perplexed by this entity's physiology and the manner in which it feeds, I attempted to uncover the experiment log for SCP-4966. I was unable to access it in its entirety, but did get my hands on several excerpts that I found quite illuminating. They answered absolutely none of my initial questions, but were thoroughly entertaining to read just the same. I won't keep you in suspense. Allow me to elaborate. In one experiment, a deceased adult male timber rattlesnake was placed in front of SCP-4966. The creature quickly devoured it and began to change. Its torso extended 150 centimeters longer than it previously had, and its abdomen terminated in a visibly developed tail and rattle. After lengthening in this way, the creature used its new shape to snake around the limbs and bodies of attending researchers. It did not wrap tightly enough to restrict blood flow, but instead appeared to be interested in providing the researchers with hugs. The rattle was shaking at a near constant rate throughout this process, not as a warning of impending peril, but more in the manner that a dog might wag its tail when excited. When four hours had passed, SCP-4966 proceeded to regurgitate a mass of decomposing keratin and liquefied organic matter. During another test, SCP-4966 was fed an adult female lionfish at an advanced stage of decomposition. In spite of the fish's venomous spines, SCP-4966 suffered no adverse effects when consuming it. After swallowing its unappetizing meal, SCP-4966 developed a pair of pectoral fins, a rear fin, and a large dorsal fin that was constructed of several long spines. SCP-4966 struggled to move with these fins, primarily flopping along the ground like a fish out of water. A chemical analysis of the spines matched the composition of lionfish venom, and the researchers avoided touching the creature for the remainder of the test. When it was time to regurgitate, SCP-4966 spat up some broken spines and liquefied organic matter. With reptiles and fish taken care of, the research team decided to get a little bit wild and introduced SCP-4966 to some plant matter. Frankly, I'm glad to see it getting a well-balanced diet and eating some greens for once. Well, browns, really. It was presented with a pile of deceased sycamore maple leaves. SCP-4966 consumed one single leaf, then immediately regurgitated it. Not a fan of vegetables, I suppose. It spent the remainder of the test playing with the pile of leaves, climbing up onto its provided furniture, 
then diving into the leaves again and again, emitting high-pitched, gleeful vocalizations. During another test, a severely damaged female ostrich corpse was presented to SCP-4966. Still, the extent of the degradation did not seem to impact SCP-4966's anomalous ability. Because upon consumption, the creature's legs extended approximately 1.3 meters, developing two large toes, and its head extended approximately 1.2 meters upward, forming a large, curved neck. A pair of featherless wings sprouted from the sides of SCP-4966's torso. The creature attempted to fly using these wings, but much like the ostrich that had imbued it with them in the first place, it was sadly flightless. Upon regurgitating several shattered portions of bone and a large amount of liquefied organic matter, it reverted to its usual form. During another experiment, SCP-4966 was presented with the head of a male adult eastern moose, taxidermied and well-preserved. SCP-4966 quickly consumed this taxidermy, no doubt missing from some tackily decorated hunting lodge, and began to transform. It developed large antlers, approximately 1.4 meters across. Due to the size of these antlers, relative to SCP-496's head and the rest of its body, its sense of balance and mobility were severely hindered, causing it to wobble with every step. Additionally, it developed large ears that, due to a lack of structural support, could not remain upright, and instead flopped down around the creature's head. I only wish that the experiment log had included a photo because, to be perfectly frank, the resulting effect sounds utterly adorable. Less adorable is what SCP-4966 regurgitated after the test, a large, compact mass of metal, wood pulp, and shattered bone. Curious to see how close an item needed to be to an actual corpse to be effective, the researchers provided SCP-4966 with a pair of genuine leather boots. This was, I assume, an attempt to see if SCP-4966 would recognize these as part of a deceased cow or not. The answer, it would appear, is not. SCP-4966 approached the boots curiously, lightly biting the toe of the left boot as if tasting it. Then it moved on to the right boot, gently biting the toe, then giving up on eating them. SCP-4966 knocked over the right boot, climbed inside of it, and promptly fell asleep. Soft snoring could be heard from within for the next hour. At this point in my research, I was prompted to enter some additional security credentials. Luckily, through methods I don't feel especially comfortable disclosing here, I was able to obtain these very credentials and continued my investigation. What secrets could a sentient plush toy, albeit an anomalous omnivorous one, have that would require this level of secrecy? I know that curiosity killed the cat, but I was banking on the probability that satisfaction would bring it back, as well as the fact that I am rather notably lacking in feline attributes. So I proceeded. It seems that after exhausting all other species, the research staff decided to provide SCP-4966 with a human corpse, that of D-01763 to be exact. When SCP-4966 consumed this body, there were no apparent physical alterations to the creature at all. However, it did begin to vocalize, speaking for the first time in recognizable, although slightly incoherent English. Blessed with the ability to communicate clearly for the first time, the entity made several complaints about its enclosure, specifically the low-quality material of its bedding. But then, it revealed something fascinating. When it consumes a deceased human, SCP-4966 is able to access the memories of that person. It also apparently gains the ability to speak at the level of a young child. This capacity for speech is lost when the organic matter of the meal is regurgitated, but the memories remain. A compelling enough discovery on its own, but what happened next was truly shocking. Shortly after this foray into human experimentation with SCP-4966, the Chaos Insurgency staged a raid on Site-17, during which they attempted to gain access to several anomalies, including SCP-4966. This raid proved unsuccessful, but its occurrence, and the discovery of a Chaos Insurgency document containing classified Foundation information on SCP-4966 raised several concerning questions. How did the Insurgency gain this information? Why were they so interested in SCP-4966, and how did they know where it was contained? Several corpses of insurgency members were provided to SCP-4966 in an attempt to uncover the answers. Once it regained the ability to speak, Dr. Randall Bannock conducted an interview with SCP-4966. For the first two hours and 14 minutes of the interview, SCP-4966 was not helpful in the slightest. It focused its attention on a relentless demand for snacks, or, as it calls them, munchies. After giving the creature seven biscuits, 
Dr. Bannock was beginning to lose his grip and begged it to cooperate. It responded with yet another complaint. I want a better bed, too. The one you guys have is lumpy. Make a bed out of munchies so I can eat it when I get hungry. Dr. Bannock promised the creature another biscuit if it could explain how the insurgency knew its location. The red shooty people? They found the room with my name on it. Dr. Bannock sighed, then reworded his question to ask how the group knew its item number. I was in the room, so the room had my name. They made lots of banging on the door and noisy noises. I was sleeping, but it was too loud and the bed was lumpy. Dr. Bannock promised the creature that a new bed would be delivered the following day, then continued his line of questioning. How did the insurgency know where the building was? The creature refused to answer until it received an additional biscuit. The pet people who visit me, they tell the wed people stuff through the head pots. Understandably, Dr. Bannock required clarification on the identities of the, quote, pet people. Um, lots of people give me pets. The white coat woman who gives me the toys is nice. I like her. She gave me the ball with the bell in it, and it makes a ringy noise. The orange person that gives me lots of pats, but his face keeps being different between pat times. He gives me pats, though, so it's a good orange. Um, you give me munchies and smell like a cake, and that's a good munchie. Also, you said you were going to get me a good bed, but... Dr. Bannock interrupted the creature here, redirecting it to the topic at hand. After bribing SCP-4966 with two more biscuits, it continued to try and explain. I think they use the head squishies, like the one in the red guy I munched, and the one in the spiky stripey, but that one wasn't too good. This only served to add more confusion, and Dr. Bannock asked for clarification. Did the creature mean they used their brains? Um, I don't know about squishy pots. I think the big pot that looks like a watermelon is used to talk. I'm not an organ psychic. At this point, rather than do what I would do and ask what on earth an organ psychic is, Dr. Bannock pressed for details on the so-called orange person that SCP-4966 ate. Um, the orange person was colder and was kinda too mushy. The wet people had lots more stuff about shooty guns, but I don't like to hurt people, so I say no thank you, mister. The orange person had a lot more about like being stuck in a room, and I don't think they ever got to taste the crispy crunch of a munchie, which is sad. Dr. Bannock acknowledged the sadness of life without the joys of a crispy crunch, then continued his line of questioning about the brain-based communication between D-Class and insurgency members. Um, one second. I'm gonna do a real big think. SCP-4966 sat in silence for several minutes, humming to itself in confusion. I think I found something from the wed people, but it's a bit scrambly and they use some big words I don't know. They keep saying words about sonic chips, but they aren't eating any chips and I'm confused. Wait, I think the orange people had the sonic chips already. Maybe they forgot them at the store because they were saying stuff about not noticing the sonic chips. I want that munchy sonic chips like the orange person gets. Eventually, after a lot of prodding and several tangents regarding the demand for additional munchies, SCP-4966 listed the identification numbers of 14 D-Class personnel. Autopsies of each of these personnel revealed a small device in the cerebellum capable of psionic transmissions. As a reward for its help in uncovering the cause of a concerning security breach, SCP-4966 was given a bag of Tostitos brand tortilla chips, which it promptly consumed with great enthusiasm. SCP-4966 is kept within a modified humanoid containment cell, sized appropriately for the free movement of a domestic cat or creature of similar size. The cell is furnished with several pieces of cushioned furniture and recreational objects such as climbing towers, soft plush toys, and small plastic objects such as toy dinosaurs are also placed throughout the room. In addition to its toys, SCP-4966 is to be given socialization on a tri-weekly basis by the on-site researchers. Any tests involving SCP-4966 must be approved by Dr. Bannock. Several members of personnel have expressed an interest in providing SCP-4966 with additional toys and recreational objects but the Foundation has insisted that these be purchased using personal funds rather than tapping into the Foundation's budget. As far as I know, SCP-4966 lives a relatively peaceful life in the aftermath of its brush with the Chaos Insurgency. But it just goes to show that in the world of the SCP Foundation, nothing is ever as simple as it first appears. Even a soft, cuddly, squishy little plush toy can be the key to uncovering a web of secrets, conspiracy, and espionage. I'm just glad he got a nice snack after. The Switchblade's knife glints in the dark, and the bully holding it runs through the arcade, screaming in terror. The kid watches, shocked by the insanity unfolding. 
as 20 tiny, vicious gorillas chase the knife-wielding bully as tears streak his face. This situation defies all explanation, unless you know about SCP-3092. Let's go back to the beginning. The kid almost trips over his laces as his chucks hammer against the sidewalk. The headphones for his Walkman bounce against his neck as the wind rushes past. Heaving in as much air as he can, the kid runs through town, looking desperately this way and that for any grown-ups he recognizes. No one. Just strangers with thick mustaches and perms chatting outside Blockbuster and Walden books, totally oblivious to the fact that he's running for his life. The kid cocks an ear, and sure enough, he hears that all-too-familiar rolling, clattering sound coming after him. The skateboards are catching up. A few insults catch on the wind and float across to him. Four Eyes, Earthworm, and a good few names that he doesn't want to repeat. Apparently, their town used to have a good Native American community. That's why his parents had moved here. But nowadays, it seems to just be white faces all around him. From what the bullies are shouting as they chase him, and the total apathy of the grown-ups on the sidewalks at the words, it's no wonder everyone else moved away. A rock hits the back of his head, almost knocking his glasses off. The sound of the tiny wheels roars louder and louder with every block. He needs to find an escape, and fast. Home's way too far away. His parents aren't expecting him home until nightfall. He needs a spot to lay low. The arcade? It's closed today, but the owner told him where the spare key is. He could go there, but he needs to lose them first. His lungs are burning, and his legs are starting to give up on him. Ice! The kid sees it too late and steps straight onto a patch of it. His converse slides out from under him and flings his limbs this way and that, trying desperately to stay on his feet as he skids across the ice. His momentum throws him forward, and he sticks out another foot, catching himself back on the sidewalk. Perfect. He turns just in time to see the four bullies on their skateboards hitting the patch and going flying. They land in a heap together, groaning and scuffling, trying to get back up. Now's his chance. The kid shoots off down an alleyway, loops back around the block, turns up a side street, and arrives at the arcade without having looked back once. He snatches the key from under the gutter and looks around the quiet street. Nobody there, thank goodness. He darts through the door and locks it behind him with trembling fingers. Tears flood his eyes as he lets his forehead rest against the door. Every day, every damn day, it's more of the same. Why can't he just have some peace? Why can't he just be normal? The kid stands there crying for a long time. He can't tell his parents what's going on. They've got enough of their own problems. He tried to tell his teachers, but at lunch, he overheard them laughing and joking about it all between themselves. It just sometimes feels like no one's on his side. The kid takes a deep breath and rubs the moisture out of his eyes. That's enough. If he keeps thinking about it all day, it's only going to feel worse. He's on his own now. He's safe. What he needs to do is just enjoy the little bit of peace he has now before it all starts again. And what better place to be laying low than the arcade? He hits the lights. Pinball, claw machines, and arcade cabinets all light up and start playing over one another. Air hockey, basketball hoops, and foosball all beep at him invitingly. He can't help but let a smile spread across his face. He walks across the carpet looking this way and that at Frogger, Pac-Man, Galaga, Donkey Kong. So many choices, so many choices. He hops on the counter and hits the side of the cash register. It pops open, revealing trays stacked full of quarters. Mr. Burns, the guy who owns the place, told him he's allowed to let himself in and use the money in the register to play whenever he wants, on the house. As the kid scoops a handful out of the drawer, he realizes he might not be totally on his own in this town after all. Pac-Man beeps into life as soon as the quarters fall into the slot. He grabs the joystick and stares intently at the screen, darting this way and that through the maze, munching, munching, munching. Try as they might, the four ghosts just can't catch him. The kid grins. All that time running from four bullies wasn't quite for nothing, was it? But after a couple of levels, he gets bored. He always plays Pac-Man, so much so that he's memorized his route through the first few levels. Kinda takes the fun out of things a bit. He lets the ghosts surround him and watches Pac-Man swirl away into nothing. Frogger isn't much better. He never really clicked with this one for some reason, just felt too stop-start. He lets the frog get run over and stands back, letting out a sigh. Is there anything in here he hasn't touched yet? Wait, what's that? In the corner of the room, there's a new machine, still half covered in a sheet. It hasn't even been plugged into the wall yet. The kid skips over to it and bends down to hook it up. There. He stands back, takes hold of the sheet, and pulls as dramatically as he can. It billows and unfurls to reveal… a claw machine. 
Oh. It's just another claw machine. Black Tie Toys is written on the side in classic 80s lettering, just under two meters tall or so. Nothing to make it stand out from the other cabinets in here. But not only does it look boring, it doesn't have anything he wants inside. Just a bunch of plushy gorillas. Not exactly a brand new cabinet, but worth a shot anyway. The kid slots a coin in and cracks his knuckles. Here goes nothing. The claw swings to life at the slightest touch of the joystick. These things are normally rigged, so he's not exactly expecting much from it. May as well just drop the claw here. All the toys in this one are the same anyway. No way. It's caught onto one of the gorilla's feet, lifting the toy up as it dangles upside down. It swings precariously this way and that as the claw guides it over to the hole. It's a defective toy with a bit of stitching loose on its shoulder, but he couldn't care less. The thrill of getting one first time, it's… The toy drops into the chute and thumps to the bottom, just behind the little door. The kid punches the air and yells in triumph. He did it, first try. He bends down and reaches out into the little flap, just as the flap opens by itself. He freezes as a little toy gorilla opens the door for himself and hops out onto the carpet. The kid yelps and jumps backwards, tripping over his feet. Somewhere in that chute, between falling in and popping out, this little toy had… well, it had come alive. The little gorilla does the same as the kid, leaping backwards defensively. It raises two soft fists with surprisingly dexterous fingers and looks the kid up and down warily. It orders the kid in a stern, militaristic voice to identify himself. The kid's jaw drops open. It can speak? The little plushy gorilla's voice is gruff but high-pitched enough to match his size. He barely comes up to the kid's knee. The gorilla asks him if he's friendly. The kid nods quickly. The gorilla's eyes narrow. What's your favorite fruit? The gorilla asks. Uh, bananas. Phew, the gorilla says, dropping his fists. You never can be too careful. The kid dusts himself off and climbs to his feet. The gorilla deftly scales the side of the claw machine and hangs off it, surveying the arcade. The kid asks his name, which seems to stump the little toy. It picks at the loose stitching on his shoulder. The kid suggests calling him Stitches. The gorilla salutes at the sound of his new name. All right, kid, what's the operation? Give me the sit rep. Operation? Sit rep? The kid stands there, nonplussed for a moment. Well, they're in an arcade. Stitches nods sagely, taking the intel on board. And they have to stay here until nightfall. The little gorilla has already swung himself up on top of the machine to get a better view of strategic locations. And where are the hostiles? The kid hesitates. Stitches looks down at him knowingly. An unspoken understanding passes between them. They could be attacked at any moment. The pair of them take a walk around the room, the kid explaining the situation. Four bullies, three entrances, front door, alley door, and a window. No back rooms or hallways, those are all locked. The gorilla takes a candy cane from behind the counter and sticks it in the side of his mouth like a cigar. He doesn't seem to be able to chew it or even suck on it, he is just a toy after all, but the kid feels like he can't really point that out. He has no idea how fragile his comrade's ego is. Look, I can't actually taste it, okay? I can only see, hear, and touch. I'm insecure about it, leave me alone. We haven't got much time anyway, the gorilla says. We've got to prepare our defenses. The two of them go to work, Stitches barking orders at the kid as they ready themselves for the bully's arrival. The kid asks Stitches what exactly their aim is. The plushie looks at the kid like it's a trick question. Total domination, absolute victory, annihilation, a butchering. The kid straightens, suddenly feeling very unsure about all of this. He tells Stitches that he doesn't want to kill anyone or anything like that. Kill? The little gorilla falls backwards off the coin machine in surprise. Kill? No, 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 no. What's wrong with you? Of course not. We're gonna tickle, bamboozle, inconvenience, and bonk. Where those things fit within the confines of the Geneva Convention, of course. Bang, bang, bang. The hammering fists on the door are so loud that it shakes on its hinges. They've barely had ten minutes to get ready. That's not fair. The kid can see the shadows of feet blocking the streetlight. His knees go weak almost straight away at the sound of their cat calling through the cracks. They've found him. He could make a break for the alley door. If he's quiet enough, he could… but it's too late. As he looks at the fire escape, he can see another pair of legs blocking his exit. No point jumping out of the window, they'd see him straight away and have him blocked off from both sides. He looks down at his squishy little companion. They have no choice. It's time for guerrilla warfare. The front door crashes open, splinters of wood flying everywhere, and three of the bullies storm in. Front and center is their ringleader, dressed in all-black skater clothes with a constant sneer on his face. He must easily be a good foot taller than the kid, but even he looks small standing in between the twins. 
hulking egg-shaped boys with no hair on their heads or glints in their eyes. The banging noise behind the kid tells him that the fourth bully is trying to kick his way through the alley door. They don't have time to deal with that now. The twins are storming over to him like a pair of freight trains. His legs are really shaking now. He needs to move, but Stitches is gone. That loyal gorilla had been at his side just a moment ago, but as soon as trouble arrived, he disappeared, just like they always do. The twins are nearly upon him now. The kid doesn't have a choice. He takes a deep breath and closes his eyes, ready for a beating. The primal scream fills the arcade. Out of the rafters, a tiny toy gorilla swings down on a loose cable, heading straight for the twins' faces. Their round faces barely have time to go from angry to confused before the cuddly toy is on top of them, pummeling them with its soft fists. Turns out those fists aren't worth much in a fight. Twin One pulls the ape off his face and holds it at arm's length. Two of them stare at Stitches, who's swinging his fists wildly through thin air. Apparently lacking the brain power to be stunned that an inanimate cuddly toy has gained sentience, Twin One tosses Stitches over the arcade cabinets, and the pair of them continue their advance. Except the distraction worked just long enough. The kid grins and runs around the cotton candy machine, which by now is rumbling and banging, letting out a thin plume of smoke. His smile falters as they close in on him. Any second now. But the twins are closing in on him, thick arms outstretched to grab him when… bang! The cotton candy machine explodes. Hot sugary webbing bursts out in all directions, wrapping around the bullies and missing the top of the kid's ducking head by less than an inch. He can't believe that actually worked. Taking a step back to survey the damage, he looks down at the enormous twins, bound up in cotton candy and arguing with each other. The alley door crashes open, and the fourth bully rushes in. He's skinny, with tattoos all down both his arms. Looking at him now up close, the kid reckons he must be a good ten years older than the other bullies. Why he's still hanging out with high school kids is anyone's guess. The kid gulps. He's only got one more trick up his sleeve, but two bullies left to go. The ringleaders disappeared somewhere. He can't worry about that now, though. He just has to focus on the old one. The man is leering at him from the back of the arcade. He reaches round to his back pocket and pulls out something small and shiny. Flicking open the knife blade, he spins the blade around between his fingers and winks at the kid. He feels all the blood leave his face. This isn't a game anymore. He needs to get out of here. The kid makes a break for it, running towards the open front doors, but in a flash, the old bully is in front of him, playing with the knife and smiling that same sinister smile. He tries to run back the other way, to the alley door, but the bully is blocking him again, before he can even take a few steps. How is he that fast? Be calm, be calm, think. The kid reaches into his pocket. Here goes nothing. He turns to run back to the front doors, but this time throws the pinballs all across the carpet. For a second, it looks like it hasn't worked. The old bully steps in the gaps between the pinballs. He looks down to see them all there scattered around in front of him, but too late. His foot is already landing on about five metal balls that all shoot out from under him. He goes flying, crashing right into a Galaga machine head first. His leg twitches a couple times, and he goes still. The knife flies out of his hand, arcing through the air, spinning round and round and round, before landing with a gentle thud on the soft carpet. A sneaker treads onto the handle, a sneaker attached to a hairy leg sticking out of a pair of cord pants. The ringleader bends over to pick up the blade, flicks it open, and holds it against the neck of the little gorilla clutched in his arms. It would almost look funny, the bully threatening a cuddly toy, if the toy wasn't writhing around in fear. The kid cries out in panic for the knife-wielding bully to put his plush gorilla friend down. He's got nothing left, no more tricks up his sleeve. It's over. The bully just grins maniacally at him and pushes the knife harder against the squishy neck. He's got stitches by the shoulder of his arm, just above where the stitching is coming loose. The bully's back is to the cash register. On the wall behind him, dozens of giant cuddly prizes hang lifeless. The bully hisses that the kid is going to pay for making them run all over town. The kid nods his head. He will, he promises. They can beat him up or whatever they like, just don't hurt Stitches. The bully laughs at the gorilla's name. You gave him a name? You're such a loser. Couldn't come up with anything better than Stitches. What does that name even mean? Let me show you. The gorilla yells, twisting away from the blade. He reaches into the gap in his shoulder, crying out in pain, and pulls out handfuls of stuffing, throwing them up into the bully's face. It doesn't do much, but it's enough to distract him. The kid seizes his chance, dashing forward and shoving the bully square in the chest, knocking him backwards and freeing Stitches. The little gorilla runs off to safety straight away. The kid can hardly believe what he's seeing. The bully is getting to his feet now, knife still in hand, snarling. 
but almost immediately, the snarling is drowned out by the sound of a shrieking primate, then another one. Both Kid and Bully wheel round to see Stitches swinging across the wall of stuffed toys giving them high fives. As soon as he touches each of them, they transform, falling and turning into crazed gorillas, all of them rushing straight at the Bully. His eyes widen in terror, he turns on his heel and runs out through the open doors, pursued by a small army. He lashes out wildly as he goes, striking one of the gorillas down. Stitches and the kid chase him to the doorway and watch as the little toy gorillas chase the bully off into the night, swinging on lampposts and leaping over cars. Good thing he ran. Stitches climbs up onto the kid's shoulder, popping his candy cane cigar back into his mouth. Our fists are about as hard as Hello Kitty's. Let's see how long it takes him to figure that one out. A whimper behind them sobers the moment. Turning around, they see the body of the gorilla toy that the bully punched as he left. It lies slumped on a pinball machine stuffing bursting from its chest. Plumes of cotton cover the glass. Stitches buries his head in the kid's neck, sickened and devastated by the casualty. The dying gorilla looks at him with beady little eyes. It raises a dramatic hand towards him, breathing in shaky gasps. Uh, Mr. Stitches, I don't feel so good. Like a community theater actor doing Shakespeare, the little toy dies a dramatic death. Throwing his head back, he takes one desperate gasping breath and falls still. The kid stands there in shock, except the little gorilla does seem to be breathing, very lightly, as if pretending he's dead. The kid sidles up to the cabinet and pokes him. Hello? He pokes the gorilla again. It opens one eye and looks at him, annoyed. I'm out of the game, leave me alone. Stitches hits the kid on the side of the head. Hey, let him be out of the game in peace. Show some respect. Uh, sorry. The kid clasps his hands together in humility and stands by the pretend dying gorilla. Stitches salutes. Until they get bored and go off to play a game of Galaga. The storm wrenches the fishing vessel in half. The yawning sound of metal buckling and ripping can barely be heard over the explosive waves. Crew members pour out of the fragmented ship, washed away with the water, like ants fleeing a flooding nest. The deck lurches and tips upwards into the air. A wave crashes against it, almost knocking the sailor off the railing, but he clings on for dear life. Soaked through, shivering violently, and feeling the dreaded exhaustion creeping into his limbs, he looks around helplessly as his crewmates drown around him. Only one man remains on the deck with him, but the captain's usual steely confidence has gone. Behind the man's bushy beard and grizzled skin, the sailor sees a little boy scared out of his mind. The captain grabs the sailor by the scruff of the neck and hauls him close enough for them to shout over the sound of the seas around them. I saw her! The captain's rambling and ranting, repeating himself and gesticulating wildly at the seas around them. A naiad! I saw her in the water this morning! Our voyage was cursed from the start. We should never have left port. She's in the water now, she- A colossal wave throws what is left of the boat through the air. The railing slips through the sailor's fingers as he flies high between the waves. For a moment, the world stands still. It's like he's a gull hovering in place, surveying the carnage beneath him, and there in the water, what looks like. But the world isn't standing still. He hurtles back towards the ocean and slams into it, hard enough to knock the air clean out of his lungs. Icy water tugs at him, pulling him downwards, deeper and deeper, colder and colder. Like arms wrapping around him, dragging him. The sailor wakes with a start, water laps at his face. What were once hulking waves are now little more than ripples. He spits out a mouthful of sand and shakes his head, his body's trembling violently from the cold, but the warm glow of the sun on his back is already doing its best to help him. How on earth had he survived that? There are groans all around him. Dotted along the beach are his fellow fishermen. He hasn't got the energy to count them, but it doesn't look like all of them. Just ahead of him, further up the beach, sits the captain. Rocking back and forth, trembling, the captain noiselessly points a finger out to sea. Using what little energy he has left, the sailor rolls onto his back to see the silhouette of a woman standing there on the water. No, not a silhouette. The morning sunlight is shining straight through her as if she's made of nothing but water. She steps delicately across the surface of the water, walking towards the coughing fishermen who have all seen her by now. There's a delicacy to how she walks, tiptoeing gently on the rippling water as if scared of disturbing it even slightly. The light dances and glitters on her skin like it does across the ocean. No, not skin. She really is made of water. 
Every inch of her is composed entirely of what looks like the purest, cleanest water the sailor has ever seen. Was it her? The arms that he felt dragging him through the water? Did she save him? Did she save all of them? The water nymph waits with the men until the ambulances arrive. She walks across the sand going between them. Every few minutes, she dips her toes back in the sea and takes what looks like a deep breath, even though she has no lungs to fill. Then she's back amongst them, offering noiseless comfort. There's an old abandoned house just up from the beach, what looks like the mansion of a former millionaire. In apparent fascination, the nymph keeps going over to examine the ornate fountain in the courtyard. Even in a state of disrepair, the fountain is stunning. She lowers herself gently into the water and disappears under the surface, just as the first ambulance rounds the corner. As the paramedics wrap the foil blanket around the sailor and walk him to the vehicle, he catches the nymph poking her head out of the surface of the fountain's water. He's not the only one to see. Tucked just out of sight near the tree line is a nondescript black sedan with a group of men sitting inside. One of them takes a photograph of the water woman in the fountain, while another talks urgently over the phone. The sailor has barely been in the back of the ambulance for two minutes before one of the men from the car approaches him. The man holds an expensive-looking watch in his hand. Excuse me, sir, does this belong to you? The sailor sits up suspiciously. He's about to open his mouth to refute the man when the needle penetrates his thigh and the amnestic fills his bloodstream. By the time the sailor arrives at the hospital, all his memories of the previous 24 hours have slipped away into the abyss. The containment team is at work in less than six hours, while a group of agents, dressed in scrubs, follow the ambulances to the hospital to ensure all accounts of the ship's crash have been entirely erased. Another team sets to work, cordoning off the beach. A tourist family, excited about their day at the beach, argue with the disguised agents cordoning off the road. I'm sorry, ma'am, but there's nothing we can do. A shark sighting is a shark sighting. We just can't risk it today. Meanwhile, a steady stream of construction vehicles rumbles past, followed by a large Home Depot truck. They all pull up outside the mansion, where a team of agents has the fountain surrounded. Tasers and cattle prods at the ready, they grip their weapons at even the slightest ripple of water. Excavators get to work quickly, drilling at the ground around the fountain and cracking through the paving stones. And before anyone nearby has any clue of what's happening, the fountain has been removed, loaded into the back of the watertight fake Home Depot truck, and has disappeared over the horizon. The water nymph refuses to poke her head out of the water the whole way. The world around her is dark and dry. It shakes and rumbles for hours. The beautiful fountain she'd climbed into just a few hours earlier now feels tiny. There's barely enough water in here for her to swim in a circle. She'd always observed these strange-looking vehicles from a distance, lifting her eyes up above the waves for a few minutes to watch them crawling along the dark roads with their 18 wheels. She'd always wondered what was inside all of them, with their colorful paints and strange names. At least she now has some idea of what Home Depot does. Part of their business model evidently involves kidnapping. To stop the panic rising up too high in her chest, the water nymph focuses on stilling the water in the fountain. All of the bumps and turns in the road, she focuses all her energy on holding all the water in place and keeping it level. If the water around her is still, maybe she won't feel so scared. It isn't really working. But at least her precious little amount of fresh water isn't spilling out all over the watertight inside of the container. She's just about convinced herself that she's used to her cage when it suddenly stops. The rumble sound cuts out, the shaking stops, and voices somewhere outside discuss what to do with her, saying words like, containment protocol, initial testing, and security measures. The water nymph dips her head back below the surface of the water as the rear doors open. She's going to make the most of this, that's what she's decided. Having spent all her life underwater, observing the humans from afar, she'd always dreamed of one day meeting one. There had been moments, sure, times when she'd wave at a child on the deck of a ferry or guide a ship through the fog, but up close? Never. They look funny, these people. When you see them up close, they're such strange colors, so fleshy and hairy. It's bizarre not being able to see through them. How are they supposed to swim? These humans in particular are even more strange than the others. Dressed in long white coats, always walking around with clipboards and strange little devices that light up and make sounds when they poke them. She wonders if they get sick of having their legs stuck to the ground all the time. What if they see something interesting floating above them? They can't just swim upwards, they need to get on one of those plain things. This will be fun, getting to meet real people for the first time. She keeps telling herself that because if she doesn't, it all becomes too scary. They haven't put her back in the sea, a river, or even a pool. They've just kept her in her fountain. 
It sits right in the middle of a brightly lit chamber. Four white walls, a white ceiling, and a white floor. One white door. The lights are always on, the temperature always the same. For days and days, she just sits in her fountain, alone. Occasionally, one of the humans will come in wearing a big rubber suit. They look totally ridiculous. Taking big, slow steps, they'll approach her fountain. The first time, she jumped up out of the water to greet the human, doing her best to wave like she's seen them do to each other. But the human immediately turned around and ran back out of the chamber. So next time, she was slow and gentle, raising both her hands innocently and letting the human approach without doing anything. The human lowered some kind of glass container into the water in her fountain and took some of the water away. He must have been thirsty. She's seen the humans get like that sometimes. How they're not thirsty all the time, she has no clue. It doesn't look like there's a drop of water anywhere in them, except for their eyes. She tries to catch the human's eye as he leaves, but he just walks straight out of her chamber, carrying away the little container of water. But this time, she has an idea. She waits patiently for a few days, waiting for another one of the humans to come and see her. It's hard to tell how much time has passed because it's always sunny in here, but it must have been a few days by now. Sure enough, the door opens and a human in another big rubber costume comes in. She rises out of the water slowly so as not to scare them and lets her form melt and shift. Feeling her body flow into a different shape, she does her best to copy the human's big rubber suit. She's practiced this for years in the sea, copying the shapes of different humans she sees. The human stops walking and stares at her. She tries to wave again. The human waves back. Success! For almost a minute, they stand there waving at each other. She knows this is longer than most humans would wave at each other, but it's just so exciting she can't help herself. Maybe this will be her first friend. Imagine that, having a human friend. The human takes a hesitant step towards her. This is her chance. Lifting herself up and out of the water, the nymph steps out of her fountain for the first time. She pauses, careful not to spook the human. They do scare very easily, but this time, he stays. Better than that, he takes another step towards her, then another until they're within touching distance. She can feel the water beating in her chest, pumping excitedly through her body. The human has another one of those glass containers in its hand. It raises the container up slowly for her to look at. She leans in to see why this strange little creature is showing her a piece of glass. She's seen these a thousand times before in the seas. There's glass and plastic everywhere for her to look at. What's so special about this one? The human takes a swipe at her. The glass container strikes the side of her head and extracts a chunk of water. She staggers away, hands raised in fear. What had she done wrong? Why did the human do that to her? She feels faint, her head swims and not in the usual pleasant way. Her body works hard to redistribute all the water around her body, rebuilding that part of herself in a split second, but it doesn't stop the pain or the sudden wave of tiredness. She stumbles back into the fountain and plunges beneath the surface, letting the water merge with her body again. But the surface of the fountain isn't still. It trembles and shakes as she lies at the bottom in fear. Why had the human done that to her? By the time she has the courage to peek out of the water again, the human is gone. The lights in the ceiling seem brighter than ever. The next day is the first time she really misses the sea. She would race from coast to coast, feeling herself getting dragged along in the ocean gyres as she flowed between continents. She would study the rainbow colors of the Great Barrier Reef before catching a current to Venice or Jamaica. She'd hug the bottom of cruise ships and dance in and out of the propellers on the backs of cargo ships. But here, in her cell, all she can do is swim around her fountain, round and round in circles. That is, until the humans return. Three of them come into her room, each carrying strange long objects. She's not sure she's seen those things before and is desperate for a closer look, but after what happened with the glass the other day, it doesn't seem like a good idea. She still hasn't worked out what she did wrong there, but clearly the human was not happy with her for some reason. Best to be very gentle with them for the time being, until they're proper friends. The three humans have a box with them, full of water. She's so excited to see it, she leaps straight out of the fountain before realizing she needs to be careful. Patiently as she can, she approaches the box and touches it. The humans nod encouragingly. Her excitement overwhelms her, and she dives right in. It feels so good to have fresh water to explore, even if it's just a small tank. She barely even notices as they close the lid on her and wheel her into a different room. A glass wall lines the edge of this new chamber. Funny little humans in white coats stand behind it, making notes. She climbs out of her little tank and waves at them. It's a smaller room than her normal one. Why have they brought her in here? A slamming noise behind her makes her jump. 
and she spins around to see the three humans have wheeled away her little tanks on wheels, leaving her alone in the room. She looks around with a little anxiety. There's nowhere to swim in here. Have they made a mistake? She can't be here without water. Doing her best to copy human movements, she tries to mime to the people behind the glass that she needs her water. They don't seem to understand her, just start scribbling even more things on their clipboards. It's warm in here. Warm and dry. This isn't good. In no time at all, she can feel herself drying out. An hour goes by, then another. She's never been out of the water for this long. What are they doing? Don't they understand what she is? Her head starts to feel faint. She slumps down on the floor and turns herself into a ball. Shaped like this, hopefully. She won't be evaporating so fast. Then they'll give her the water back. For hours she sits in a ball, waiting, until mercifully her little tank on wheels returns and she's taken back to her fountain. They do the same to her the next day and the day after that, starving her for hours and returning her to her fountain. They top up the water in it occasionally, but other than that, they don't seem to be doing anything nice for her at all. Are they doing this on purpose? Surely not. She's their friend. She's being kind, doing all of their weird games even when she doesn't want to. Humans aren't cruel, they wouldn't do that to her. But then she finds herself in a different situation entirely. They do the same as they've been doing for the previous few days, wheeling her into the testing chamber and making her stand there on her own. But it's colder today, much colder. She tries to explain to them through the glass, rubbing her shoulders and shivering, but they just keep making their notes. This isn't good. She can't stand the cold. It's not good for her. Painful crystals start forming on the surface of her skin, stabbing into her and solidifying her body. She cries out noiselessly, but the humans keep going until she feels herself losing consciousness. Weeks go by, and with each experiment they do, the water nymph worries more and more that these humans aren't really her friends. They've started giving her mazes, complex plastic structures that she gets forced unceremoniously into, where she has to swim through various pipes and tubes until she can push a button on the other side. At first, she was expecting a prize. Maybe this is why they had her kept here for so long. They needed help solving these puzzles, and their fleshy bodies couldn't fit through the tubes. But nothing happens when she presses the button. They just pull a plug and drain her out of the bottom. Today, she's had enough. When are they going to put her back in the ocean? She's just going to wait here at the start of the maze until they tell her. It's only fair. The water in her chest leaps for joy as a human enters the test chamber and approaches her. She raises out of the water and waves to greet him, just as he lifts the long, strange device in his hand and jabs it into her chest. The electricity shoots all through her body and sets her mind ablaze. It takes all her strength not to burst into a thousand droplets. Convulsing and crying, she falls backwards into the maze. The human brandishes the weapon at her again. She has nowhere to go but into the maze. She solves it in a split second, but as she presses the button, she feels a sinking feeling settling over her. What if they don't want to let her out? It's all her fault. What was she thinking? Her one shot at making friends, and she'd blown it. She sits crying in her fountain, feeling her tears flow into the water around her and back into her body. It was the acid. She hates acid and always has. She'd swam near a factory once and got a dose of it. It hurt more than anything she'd ever felt before. It would flow into her chest and sit there, burning and burning. She can still feel it now. So when the humans in the rubber suits had poured some into her fountains, she'd lost her temper, slamming into them with all her force. For months they've been hurting her, jabbing her and exhausting her. But they're her friends, right? And you shouldn't hurt your friends. You definitely shouldn't kill your friends. You shouldn't rip open their rubber suits and force yourself down their throats, drowning them in their own bodies. Her fountain's red with blood and burns from the acid. And it's all her fault. What had she done wrong to make them treat her like this? Why couldn't they just be friends? After a few weeks, a group of humans come in and clean up the mess, refilling her fountain with clean water. She doesn't lift her head above the surface. They install a pipe above her fountain that drip feeds water onto her. Drip, drip, drip. And just like that, she's no longer seen as human. Drip, drip, drip. The lights burn white. The door stays closed. Drip, drip, drip. The water nymph sits in her fountain. Drip, drip, drip. After a year, she stops crying. A year after that, she gives up on thinking, too. Three years of near silence pass, with only the sound of dripping water from the pipe until the door to her chamber opens. Something flutters in her chest. She lifts her head out of the water. A friend? 
The night watchman's hand shakes, shuddering the beam from his flashlight. He can't believe his eyes. Never in all his time on the job has he ever expected to see something like this. It can't be real. It all begins earlier that night. The newly hired watchman arrives at the site of his new position, guarding a Chuck E. Cheese after dark. It seems a bit excessive, even he thinks so. After all, it's just a restaurant with some arcade games and admittedly creepy animatronic entertainment. Why would it need a dedicated person to keep an eye on it overnight? Sitting down in the security office, he sips his coffee in front of the old TV monitors. Grainy footage from all the building's security cameras flickers on screen. He stares at the display, but doesn't really see it. The night watchman's eyes glaze over. He's already bored. In his boredom, his mind starts to wander. He thinks back to the wanted advertisement for this posting. It had mentioned several reports of movement late at night within the restaurant. None of it made much sense to him. Who'd want to break into a children's restaurant in the middle of the night? Probably just some teenagers, he thinks. Suddenly, a loud noise startles the night watchman. The sound of something metal clattering to the floor. It's coming from the kitchen. Someone's still here. He grabs his flashlight from his belt and rushes through the restaurant, leaving just before a shadowy figure passes one of the security cameras. The night watchman clicks on the flashlight and starts to search, the light from it casting creepy shadows as it falls over the various robotic animals. They give him chills just to look at them. He can't imagine that kids ever enjoy seeing the characters flap their mouths to weird, annoyingly catchy songs. Another noise, footsteps this time. He turns towards the back of the restaurant, the kitchen, where greasy, unhealthy junk food is prepared for hordes of screaming, rowdy children. Stepping out of the dark but brightly decorated main restaurant area into the kitchen, with all its stainless steel work surfaces, was like suddenly arriving on another planet. Instantly, his flashlight falls over what had caused the first sound, a trash can, toppled over to allow someone to rummage around inside. There's a trail of garbage, and the night watchman follows it. It leads him around the parts of the building reserved for employees, only to veer back out towards the restaurant. The more he follows, the closer he gets to the play area, a brightly colored foam pen where overly energetic kids can run around freely, giving their parents a momentary break as they burn off all the sugar and calories from the low-quality food. But as he approaches the ball pit, he sees it. It's like an occult ritual, a circle of almost 20 children hurling slices of half-eaten Chuck E. Cheese pizza into the ball pit. Not one of them notices him, too focused on their strange ritual to even register the light from the flashlight. The night watchman is about to call out to demand to know what the heck is going on, how they all got in here and where their parents are. But then he sees something beneath the plastic balls. Something is stirring, moving in response to the children throwing pizza into the pit. And as it crawls out, the night watchman is met with the sight of something vile lurking in the ball pit. Stumbling upon what looks to be the secret meeting of a bizarre ball pit cult is hardly something that the average night watchman or security guard will ever have to experience. Even one working for an establishment like Chuck E. Cheese, the very worst they might find themselves dealing with, is particularly rowdy customers, or the restaurant's animatronic characters getting a little quirky at nighttime. But thanks to the SCP Foundation's investigations into this particular branch of Chuck E. Cheese, they've uncovered exactly what it is about the building that draws such unusual attention. You see, there really is something lurking beneath the ball pit, something now known as SCP-6059. Here at the SCP Foundation, the securing of anomalies is one of the core tenets of the organization. After all, that's what the S in the name stands for. And as such, the Chuck E. Cheese containing SCP-6059 had to be requisitioned. Fortunately, the cover story of the restaurant shutting down after a major health code violation seems to have been a believable ruse. And after all, it's not too far from the truth. You could say that the place does have something of a pest problem. Now that it's no longer a restaurant and arcade, the site serves as a foundation facility established specifically to research SCP-6059. Following some extensive analysis, researchers have determined what drew the cult-like group of children to the ball pit in the first place. It isn't an anomalous property of the building itself. There's nothing unique about this former Chuck E. Cheese franchise that causes such abnormal behavior. That all comes from the thing living in the ball pit. SCP-6059 is a particularly unusual creature and not just to look at, although it's certainly not easy on the eye. In fact, it's been known to turn more than a few researchers' stomachs around the facility. Its amorphous body is around the size of an average human toddler 
But if you were expecting it to resemble anything made of flesh and blood, then well, you might be disappointed and possibly put off your food. Structurally, the creature is comprised of a mixture of discarded and stomach-churning substances, primarily pizza sauce and plastic, along with various other waste materials. The plastic component is visible in the form of two of the plastic balls from the ball pit where it resides, placed on top of SCP-6059's blob-like head. Each one of those two plastic balls sports a hand-drawn pupil to resemble the creature's eyes, although no one is quite sure if SCP-6059 can actually see out of these or if they're more for show. Despite the strange and unnerving state it was found in, and being generally pretty unsettling to look at, SCP-6059 doesn't seem to be a violent anomaly. While not outwardly aggressive, it certainly doesn't reach the same levels of friendliness as other amorphous SCPs, such as the well-known and much-adored SCP-999, the Tickle Monster. But fortunately, especially for those researching it, SCP-6059 has come pre-contained for the SCP Foundation's convenience. What does that mean? Well, while it's not unheard of, not all anomalies come with their own containment cell. No, really, we aren't joking. SCP-6059 can't leave the ball pit. Despite the only thing separating it from freedom being a fence of thin, mesh netting and a pool of plastic balls that is only knee-deep, SCP-6059 is trapped. Although, that hasn't stopped the creature from claiming it is fully capable of escape. That's right, SCP-6059 can speak, too, and it has something of a high opinion of itself as well something that SCP Foundation researcher Dr. Zacharias Rosemary has discovered through extensive meetings with the Beast of the Ball Pit. Dr. Rosemary is sent to the Chuck E. Cheese facility housing SCP-6059 at the behest of the Department of Anomalous Ambassadors. This is a specialized research division within the SCP Foundation that intends to improve the direct communication between personnel and anomalies themselves. And what branch would be better suited for learning just why SCP-6059 had its own following of devoted cultists when it was first discovered? Stepping inside the room containing the ball pit, Dr. Rosemary approaches the net barrier between him and the creature within. As per the instructions he has been given only moments before, Zacharias carefully opens the entrance, sealed with nothing more than a simple zipper. Dragging it down, he slips through and stands surrounded by plastic balls, reaching up to his knees. He calls out, knowing the anomaly can hear him, trying to get it to emerge and engage in a conversation with him. Sure enough, only a few meters away, the plastic balls of the pit shuffle and then part as SCP-6059 pops its amorphous head out from below. It greets Dr. Rosemary in an enthusiastic, almost accusatory way, demanding to know the answer to a strange question. Thing in my pit, are you balls? Of course, being a human being and not comprised of plastic balls, Dr. Rosemary has no choice but to answer the creature truthfully. But this doesn't go down well with SCP-6059. The creature immediately becomes highly agitated, shouting at the researcher to get out and leave. To emphasize its distress, SCP-6059 even starts gathering the plastic balls from around it and hurls them directly at Zacharias. If you've ever had a plastic ball from a ball pit thrown at you, then you know that it's hardly a pleasant experience. Although those balls are only lightweight, with enough force behind one, they can certainly pack a punch. Dr. Rosemary makes his hasty retreat from the barrage of plastic balls back beyond the safety of the net fence. Once he's out of range, the formless, messy face of SCP-6059 seems to frown before it disappears beneath the surface of the balls once again. Several other researchers and other personnel from around the site make their own attempts to converse with SCP-6059, met with the same reaction. It clearly doesn't feel like talking. But now that he knows the reaction wasn't unique to him, Dr. Rosemary is reassigned to try and get through to SCP-6059 again. This time, however, he's come prepared. Based on their brief encounter, the anomalous being seems to be childlike in its temperament and prone to misbehaving. So, Zacharias has devised a plan for his next interviews. If SCP-6059 starts acting out again, then the researcher intends to treat it like he would a disobedient child by putting the creature in a timeout. Heading back to the ball pit for a second attempt, Dr. Rosemary is also armed this time around. Well, with a family-sized Chuck E. Cheese pizza, at least. And it's not exactly a weapon, more of a peace offering to appease SCP-6059. Or a sacrifice. 
Passing through the mesh netting into the ball pit, Dr. Rosemary holds the box just above the surface. Almost immediately, SCP-6059 bursts out and chomps down on the pizza box, yanking the whole thing back down beneath the plastic balls to devour it. Zacharias tries to encourage it to talk again, and SCP-6059 makes no secret that it approves. You have appeased me with a sacrifice. You may speak, non-ball. Straight away, Dr. Rosemary wants to get down to business and asks the creature outright what it is, but the response is far from a coherent answer. Tell me, mortal, have you ever had an enlightened experience in a pit? Confused by what it means, the Foundation researcher tries to ask for clarity, but SCP-6059 has little to offer in that department. It seems obsessed with the contents of the ball pit, referring to the divine, higher power of the balls. Baffled and struggling to answer, Dr. Rosemary recounts an instance from his childhood where he got sick after playing in a similar pit in a McDonald's. This seems to be what the creature wanted to hear, judging by its response of, Yes, this is it. You have been touched by my blessing. You are a prophet of the pit. The anomaly apparently implies that it is some kind of deity, or at least, it thinks that it is. Capable of bestowing a divine blessing in the form of illness, which seems appropriate since SCP-6059 looks like it's riddled with germs. But Zacharias points out that the creature hasn't exactly answered his question. Hearing this, SCP-6059 seems a little confused, then pauses for a moment before hurling more balls at Dr. Rosemary and shouting again. He goes to leave the pit and warns SCP-6059 that if it doesn't behave itself, then he'll put it in a timeout. It responds by launching another ball and hitting the researcher right between the eyes. That settles it. The anomaly has earned itself a timeout. Putting his new plan into action, Dr. Rosemary shuts off the lights and leaves the room. SCP-6059 doesn't like it one bit, angrily throwing more balls at the mesh every few minutes, demanding that the lights be turned back on and that it be released from timeout. After a few short moments, it seems to settle and looks around in the dark for any sign of the researcher or any other members of personnel. Please come back. Now that he's shown the creature what the consequence is for bad behavior, Dr. Rosemary returns to the ball pit and sets out very clearly his expectations. It's very simple. As long as SCP-6059 behaves and cooperates, it'll receive pizza as a sacrifice. If not, should it decide to misbehave and act in a disruptive or disobedient way, then it will get put back in timeout. And surprisingly, the unruly anomaly agrees to adhere to these rules going forward. Their next interview begins much the same as the previous one, with Dr. Rosemary bringing another pizza for SCP-6059 to gobble up. He asks if the creature is ready to behave, to which it nods. Trying to be as amicable as possible, Dr. Rosemary explains that they got off on the wrong foot and that they're going to start over. He tells SCP-6059 to just answer his questions honestly, and the anomaly agrees to his terms. Then, the researcher asks again, wanting to know exactly what SCP-6059 is. I am Batulai, god of the pit. I hold divine power over the pit and all within. This hardly explains much, apart from confirming that SCP-6059 does think that it is some kind of god. Dr. Rosemary presses it for more information, and the creature responds by describing the pit and its many balls as its domain that SCP-6059 oversees. It implies that the ball pit can bestow blessings of some description, but the Foundation has confirmed that it's just an ordinary ball pit. Next, Zacharias decides to ask if Botuli SCP-6059 is the god of all ball pits or just this one, and comments that the creature hasn't made much attempt to try and escape its confinement. SCP-6059 seems to take this personally, insisting that it is more than capable of leaving the pit due to being all-powerful. Dr. Rosemary challenges it to do just that, to which SCP-6059 responds by reaching for one of the plastic balls. He urges the creature to make smart choices. Putting the ball back, it confirms that its domain is just the one ball pit it currently resides in. Dr. Rosemary pushes for more information, although SCP-6059 is reluctant to give answers. It needs some gentle encouragement, shying away when asked why this specific ball pit. But eventually, Zacharias coaxes answers out of the creature, 
It says it just woke up there one day. It came into being within the filth and waste lurking at the bottom of its pit. Then, Dr. Rosemary asked about the children. You see, SCP-6059 is the reason the strange cult-like group had gathered in the ball pit. It has the ability to spread some kind of influence that makes anyone under the age of 10 start to worship it. This usually occurs after around 20 minutes of being near SCP-6059 and leads to those affected to form a circle around the creature while praising its might and power, as well as throwing slices of Chuck E. Cheese pizza into the ball pit as sacrifices to SCP-6059. My divine servants, loyal subjects who sung high praises and brought me offerings, a god is nothing without followers. Followers spread word of your power and gain you influence. With followers, worshippers, you are remembered as mighty in the Pantheon. With worshippers, you gain offerings, and you live forever. When Dr. Rosemary asks why children, the anomaly describes feeling a kinship with them. It's not hard to see why, given the creature's tendency to misbehave and overestimation of its own importance. Seeing Zacharias taking notes, SCP-6059 asks if the doctor has become one of his supposed followers. After all, Dr. Rosemary has brought offerings of pizza and seems to be writing down stories about SCP-6059. I do not feel my influence working upon you, yet you perform the steps of worship regardless. Have you accepted the glory of the balls? Have you decided to become a follower of mine? Of course, Zacharias is just making notes of their interaction in the interest of research. He warns SCP-6059 not to overthink it before wrapping up the interview, once again leaving SCP-6059 alone in the ball pit. The security cameras observing the creature's chamber record it becoming irritable at being left alone. It throws more balls at the mesh for several hours in an attempt to get someone to pay it attention. Come back. Then it sinks back beneath the plastic balls. The very next day, there is a significant difference in the following interaction between SCP-6059 and Dr. Rosemary. The creature actively requests to speak with the researcher. It wants to talk. Or maybe it wants the company, but can't quite articulate it. Agreeing to return to the ball pit as per SCP-6059's requests, although assuming the creature might just be wasting his time for attention, Dr. Rosemary is greeted with a confession. The anomaly explains it has been greatly bothered since their most recent meeting. SCP-6059 explains that, previously, it has been content with its domain, not wanting for anything other than the pit and the balls within. It was content, and it managed to garner a small cult of worshipping followers, but now it feels as if something is wrong. SCP-6059 continues, describing the time when it first awoke in the pit. Back then, SCP-6059 has a feeling, a need for something. But it doesn't know what, and there is nothing it can do to stop this strange, unfamiliar feeling. All the newly congealed amorphous creature knows is that it is a divine deity. Around it is the ball pit, its domain. Eventually, the anomaly meets the children, and thanks to its influence, they begin to worship it. And it's their kindness and sacrifices that make SCP-6059 feel important. But once its followers are gone, and SCP-6059 is found by the Foundation, that same negative feeling returns, until it meets Dr. Rosemary. As the creature continues to explain, it describes how upset it feels to be left alone in the pit, and that speaking with Zacharias can alleviate that feeling. Then, when the researcher leaves, the feeling comes back. It confuses and upsets a bewildered SCP-6059, but offers some words of comfort and even another pizza. Dr. Rosemary explains that it's his job to take care of SCP-6059 and ensure the creature is okay. The anomalous blob rightly points out that he didn't have to come this time. After all, he could have ignored SCP-6059's request to talk. It wasn't required by the Foundation that Dr. Rosemary conduct an interview today. Zacharias puts it in simple terms that SCP-6059 can understand. He agreed to talk not because he has to, but to ensure the creature is all right and to learn more about it, but mostly because he understands SCP-6059 just needs a friend. 
To begin, SCP-6059 is unfamiliar with the concept. It's never had a friend before, only those that worship it because of its anomalous influence. Over time, the creature seems to have developed a sense of self-superiority because of this, believing itself to be a god. But Dr. Rosemary explains that a friend cares about someone not out of a need to worship them, but instead out of respect. Friends offer support or food or gifts to a friend in need, not out of obligation, but because it is the right thing to do. Zacharias tells SCP-6059 that friends listen to and care about each other not because they have to, but because they can. Are you my friend, Doctor? Naturally, Dr. Rosemary agrees, as long as that is something that SCP-6059 wants. In response, the creature playfully throws a plastic ball between the doctor's eyes. Ouch! The boy on the bus turns around. Did someone pull out one of his hairs? He looks around, but the girl in the seat behind him is staring out the window. She's so quiet and always keeps to herself, he doesn't think it possibly could have been her. The boy turns back around, wondering if he just imagined it, unable to see the small smile forming on the girl's face. The bus stops, and the girl practically sprints off and up the sidewalk to her house. She runs past her mother without saying hello and goes straight into her bedroom, closing and locking the door behind her. She sits at her desk, opens a drawer, and pulls out a small bag. She reaches into the bag and takes out a folded piece of paper. Congratulations on your purchase of a genuine naughty stalker. Do you love someone but they won't give you the time of day? Do you wish you could hear what they say about you behind their back? Well, wonder no more. Using this fantabulous product, you can keep track of your loved one's every move, their every word. The girl imagines herself watching a tiny version of the boy on the bus right here on her desk, seeing everything that he does, listening to his secret thoughts and desires. If only she knew him better, then she'd have the confidence to talk to him and could get him to like her as much as she liked him. She reaches into the bag and pulls out the naughty stalker. It doesn't look like much, just a little doll made from a woven and twisted length of red string. She looks back to the instructions. All you have to do is get a single hair from the head of the object of your desires, slip it under a loose string in our naughty stalker, and see what you've been missing. The girl reaches into her pocket and takes out a single strand of hair. She holds the hair up to the light, looking at it. If this works, it will mean all of her dreams coming true. Just like the instructions said to do, she takes the hair and slides it under a string on the doll's body. She sets the doll down on her desk and waits. And waits. And... nothing happens. She picks up the instructions again, turning them over. But there's nothing else except, another wonderful product brought to you by blah blah blah. Where were the rest of the instructions on how to get it to work? Why wasn't the doll coming to life? What a piece of junk. What a… wait. What was that? The girl leans in close. Is the doll… breathing? She's startled as the doll turns its head over its shoulder, seemingly looking right at her, or rather, right through her. Coming, mom! The doll shouts before standing up. It starts to walk in place, looking like it is opening invisible doors, and then sitting down on a chair that she can't see. It looks like it's pretending to eat dinner. The girl's eyes widen. The doll is alive. It's really alive. It's actually showing what the boy is doing right now. The naughty stalker has worked. The girl is fascinated by watching the little doll that gives her a peek into her crush's life. She skips her own dinner so she can watch him finish his. She watches as he sits, probably watching TV, takes a shower, and gets ready for bed. It may all just be a little doll acting it out, but it feels like she is there with him. She watches the doll sleep for hours before falling finally asleep herself, her head resting on the desk next to him. The next morning, she passes by the boy and his friend sitting together on the bus and goes to the very back. She gets as low in the seat as she can so no one can see her and takes out the doll, holding it up to her ear. She listens to one side of the conversation as the boy talks about the action movie he watched last night, Weapon of Mass Extinction. The boy talks about how much he liked it and how it's his new favorite movie. This was perfect. It's exactly what she needed. The next day in school, as the boy is putting things into his locker, the girl approaches. She pretends to trip and drops her books in front of him, the books scattering on the floor in front of him. The boy helps her pick them up and notices the DVD she dropped, Weapons of Mass Extinction. 
She explains that she brought her favorite movie to school to loan it to a friend. What a coincidence that they both happen to love the same film. The boy and the girl, bonding over their love of low-budget sci-fi action films, start spending more and more time together. No one has ever understood him the way that she does. It's as if she has known him for years, even though they've only been friends for a few days. Things move quickly though, and before long, he realizes that he is having romantic feelings for the girl. This is all the girl had ever wanted, and it's all thanks to the naughty stalker. Things are going so well, in fact, that she imagines she won't even need it much longer. But then, something strange happens. She is sure she heard the boy tell his friend that he loved baseball, but when she brings up the idea of going to a game together, the boy looks at her like she was crazy. He hated baseball. After that, things seem to change. The boy is still so nice when they are together. Now it sounds like he is talking about her behind her back. She worries that she has been wrong this whole time, that he has just been messing with her. This stupid doll isn't making her dreams come true, it's making her life a nightmare. But wait, who is the boy talking to? She leans in close to listen. Is he… with another girl? Listening to one side of the conversation, she hears the boy tell someone that this is all just a big joke, a prank he is pulling on some dumb girl. Are they… no, they can't be. Kissing? The girl is in a white-hot rage. She can't believe he would do this to her, after she was nothing but perfect to him. She throws the doll across her room. She's going to confront the boy and whoever he's with. She'll teach him a lesson. She'll teach both of them a lesson. It's starting to rain as the girl gets her bike out and starts to ride to where she knows he is, the spot that was supposed to be their own special place. Cars pass close by on the narrow road, splashing her with water, but she doesn't care. She finally reaches the picnic spot where he took her just a few days ago, and she sees a car parked nearby. It must belong to the evil seductress he is with. The girl glares at the car. She grits her teeth until they feel like they might crack. Her fists are clenched so tight that she can't tell if it's the rain or blood from her fingernails digging in that she feels running down her palms. But she doesn't care. She's going to show both of them what happens when you break someone's heart. She takes a step towards the car and… The car that struck her slams on its brakes. The driver gets out and rushes towards her. It's the boy. Her boy. The older couple who were stopped on the side of the road with a flat tire run over to help. The boy gets down next to her and cradles her head in his lap, and they have one last moment to look into each other's eyes before the light fades from hers. Unfortunately for all involved, their lives would never be the same. But how could they have known that they were the victims of an encounter with an anomaly that, while small, is extremely dangerous? One that is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-693. The Naughty Stalker SCP-693 are multiple humanoid-shaped dolls, measuring roughly 18 centimeters in length, each made from a single string that is either red, blue, yellow, or black, with onyx beads for eyes. Their clothing will vary in color and style, and seems to have no bearing on the properties of the doll. The string doll will behave exactly as one would expect, showing no anomalous properties at all until the owner takes the steps that are spelled out in the instructions that always accompany SCP-693. The instruction sheet congratulates the owner on their acquisition of a naughty stalker and explains that in order to use it, a single hair from another person must be inserted into a loop of its string, at which point the doll will attune to that person. The doll will then come alive, mimicking the actions of the hair's owner in real time, including their speech. The doll will perfectly portray the attuned individual for nine days, after which point it will become unreliable. The exact way in which SCP-693 begins changing the speech and actions depends on the color of its base string, but in all cases, its end goal is to drive the current owner of the doll to their death. SCP-693 goes about this by feeding inaccurate information to the owner. Dolls made of red string try to send their owner into increasingly violent fits of rage. Dolls comprised of blue string try to depress the owner and lead them to self-harm. Yellow dolls want to make their owners attempt unwanted acts of physical love, and black dolls encourage their owners to engage in activities and place themselves in situations that are dangerous. Interestingly, SCP-693 will attune not just to the living, but to the deceased as well. 
When a dead person's hair is placed in a loop of string, the naughty stalker will come to life, just as it does when a living person's is used. But instead of acting out the speech and movements of the person, the attuned doll will claim to be the deceased person and offer to act as a spiritual guide to the owner. But just like with a living person, at the nine-day mark, SCP-693 will become unreliable and will attempt to lead the owner down a path that results in their death. Once an SCP-693 instance is successful in causing its owner's death, a new doll instance will appear and be found on the owner's body. Several of these dolls have been recovered from Naughty Stalker victims, and currently, the Foundation has seven red instances, ten blue instances, five yellow instances, and one black instance in its possession. All instances of SCP-693 contained by the Foundation were originally classified as safe and kept in Containment Locker 12C-K, but following the events of Incident 693E, that classification was revisited. During this incident, a researcher returned a Naughty Stalker doll to its containment locker, but in a lapse of judgment that went against Foundation protocols, they forgot to remove the hair that had been placed in the doll. When the locker was next opened, the dolls were observed to have all been moved. They were found in a circle around the accidentally still-attuned doll, which had been crucified upside down on the wall of the locker. It is unknown where the dolls acquired nails. After this incident, a camera was placed inside of the locker, and the results were… surprising, to say the least. It turns out that SCP-693 instances come to life when they are not observed, even when they aren't attuned. While they have not yet been observed engaging in violent acts against each other, the camera has captured the naughty stalkers appearing to reenact the final 30 minutes of their last owner's life over and over. Following this new information, all instances of Naughty Stalker dolls were moved to their own separate 25 by 25 by 25 centimeter steel containers within the containment locker, and their classification was upgraded to Euclid. SCP-693 is one of the rare anomalies where the Foundation actually has quite a good idea as to where it originates, and it was very easy to discover as well. Provided that they aren't a deception, the instructions that appear with each instance of SCP-693 are quite explicit about where they come from. After congratulating the owner on their acquisition and explaining how the doll works, the instructions close by extolling the naughty stalker as yet another wonderful product brought to you by The Factory. For those unaware, The Factory is a place with a long connection to the Foundation, though the details on that will have to wait for another file exploration. All you need to know now is that The Factory produces a huge amount of anomalies, and it appears that SCP-693 is one of them. There are theories that the dolls may have been produced as an espionage tool, but as for why their primary purpose seems to be driving their owner to their death, well that, we simply don't know. Foundation field agents draw their handguns, aiming them at the woman and the hapless intern. Those fools have no idea how dangerous the coffee machine is. They could print a biological weapon that could wipe out half the globe, a volatile chemical that could explode and take out half the block or some monstrous, gelatinous creature that could slither out of the coffee cup and become an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario by the end of the afternoon. The field agents thought that the woman and the intern were plain stupid to be messing with a device this powerful. Little did they know, the duo were actually much, much more stupid than that, as the woman's handbag full of sloshing black printer ink would imply. But could one final cup from SCP-294, a bubbling green cup of mysterious liquid, save them from the pair of ruthless advancing Foundation field agents, or would it make everything catastrophically worse? And to think, it had all been so normal just a few hours ago. The intern tells her that they're being watched. The whisper came from behind the woman's shoulder so suddenly that she spilled the stack of papers piled high in her trembling arms. Every office drone in every cubicle turns to look at her at the same time, like a swarm of drab zombies. Only, instead of getting up to come and eat her brains, they all start tutting and muttering to themselves passive-aggressively. The woman spins around and glares at the intern. He's way up in her personal space, with wide, anxious eyes that dart all around the office. He dives behind a fake plant and beckons for her to join him. She does not. She simply asks, annoyed, who's watching them? She doesn't bother keeping her voice down, which only panics the intern more. He shushes her, grabs her arm, and drags her behind the plant too. She barely knows this kid, had one awkward interaction with him in the break room a week ago where he talked at her about something called Battlestar Galactica, and since then, he'd latched onto her. Every meeting she went into, he'd sit beside her, 
Every lunch break, he'd happen to be in the elevator with her as well. She's getting real sick of it. He tells her that it's not safe, that they need to go to the basement. He said the word basement like it was some kind of government classified secret. She has absolutely no desire to go down there with him, but annoyingly, she has to go down there to mail a letter. The woman stands and turns to the room at large. He manages to jump through the closing doors behind her and starts wringing his hands nervously as they descend. The doors open, he checks that the coast is clear, and then takes off quickly down the corridor. Refusing to be a part of this whole charade, the woman walks extra slowly behind him. The basement's dusty. No one ever really comes down here anymore. All it is is one long corridor with the elevator on one side with some emergency stairs and a coffee machine on the other. Halfway along, there's a trash can and a mail chute. That's it. It seems like the cleaners don't even really bother with this part of the office. The pair of them stop by the coffee machine, the woman leaning against it with arms folded, the intern running nervous hands through his hair. We've been infiltrated. <laughs> the woman laughs at how seriously this kid is taking his little conspiracy. Infiltrated, they work for an asset distribution and holding logistics company. Even she doesn't really know what they do here. What could anyone possibly hope to gain through infiltrating this place? The intern nods his head sideways so subtly she totally misses it the first time around. He does it again, more obviously. The coffee machine? He's nodding at the coffee machine, like a maniac. The woman strides off back towards the elevator, tossing her letter down the mail chute as she goes. The intern is calling out after her, babbling away about covert agents, hidden cameras, and corporate espionage. She just lets him talk as she hits the button to call the elevator. In a desperate attempt, he seems to change tack, asking her if he can get her a drink from the machine. She laughs. There isn't a drink in the world that will convince her to entertain this conversation. The elevator arrives. The doors slide open. The intern says that there has to be something. The woman looks back at the intern. For some reason, he looks genuinely serious in his offer. She lets a dry smile spread across her face. She asks for lemonade. Freshly pressed, homemade, from her hometown in Arizona. Two spoonfuls of sugar, ice, and a sprig of mint. But to her surprise, as she steps into the elevator, the intern seems to take the whole set of instructions in his stride, punching them into a keypad on the coffee machine. The woman hits the button for her floor just as the drink starts pouring out of the machine into a paper cup. That's strange. It does look like lemonade from here. A sprig of mint drops into it as the doors start closing. The intern snatches up the cup and rushes across to her, but he's too far away. The doors are closing, closing, closing. The woman jams a foot in the door, and they open back up again. The panting intern stands in front of her, holding out the cup. Large ice cubes, a light fizz, and a sprig of mint. No way. She takes a sip, and a wave of nostalgia washes over her. Memories of childhood summers, of a world happier and brighter than this one, full of laughter, joy, and beauty. Where grass tickled between her toes, the summer breeze gently cooled her back, and the sun lit up the world before her with warmth and hope. The woman looks up at the intern, surprise on her face. That is, without question, hand-pressed lemonade from her hometown in Arizona. How had he done that? Did that coffee machine really stock lemonade? She marches over to it and stares at the machine, taking in all the details. For all intents and purposes, it looked like any other coffee machine. It's just a regular old silver and black box that you'd find in dreary offices across America. Except, actually, there is something strange about it. It has a keyboard. Not just a number pad, but a full-size QWERTY keyboard with an enter key right there. The screen simply says, enter your order now. The intern is at her shoulder, still glancing nervously back along the corridor. No one's here. Yet. Feeling a little ridiculous, but unable to deny the cup of lemonade in her pocket, the woman types out the first drink she can think of. Coffee. The intern laughs at such a boring request and tells her to use her imagination. So, she does. It takes a while, she hasn't used her imagination in years. Working in a place like this, there's little reason to ever get it out of its cage. After a few seconds of thought, the most exotic thing she can think of is... Vanilla Milkshake. She hits the enter key. Immediately, a paper cup drops into place, and out of the nozzle, pours a thick, milky liquid with tiny black flecks in it. She takes a sniff, takes a sip, and then takes a gulp. That's a milkshake, no two ways about it. And a pretty good one at that. She laughs and turns to the intern. This is the most fun thing to happen in this office since Keanu Reeves almost came into the lobby, but then realized he was in the wrong place. 
She'll have to tell everyone about this upstairs. It'll be the talk of the office. But the intern grabs her arm as she goes to leave and pulls her back. There's a very serious expression on his face. Without a word, he pulls her back over to the machine and starts typing. Gasoline. Without hesitation, a new cup appears and out pours a shimmering fluid that hits the woman's nose so quickly she can identify it straight away. Covering her nose, she stares at the cup incredulously. Why would a drinks machine be able to dispense something like that? The intern is fuming with himself. That cup of gasoline stinks to high heaven. If they're being watched and suddenly start walking around the office holding a cup of gas, they'll be found out in an instant. That reminds the woman. Wait, so who is it who's following you? He first noticed it three weeks ago. Being an intern, it was his job to hand out the mail to everyone in the office. In a business spanning 13 floors, he was one of the only employees to actually regularly visit each floor. Most people would go to their same desks every day, sit next to the same people, then go home, blissfully unaware of the hundreds of others sitting above and below them. But not him. Every morning, the intern would do the rounds, going from bottom to top floor one by one, handing out the post to each cubicle. Only a handful of people bothered to talk to him, and so he really noticed all of a sudden when one of them stopped showing up to work. A mother in her mid-fifties, stable life, stable marriage, she'd always been very warm towards him. But one day, when he rounded the corner, she was gone, replaced by a man in a very neat pressed black suit, dry cleaning tag still hanging from the collar. Not thinking too much of it, the intern had gone about his week a little sadder, but generally unconcerned. Unforeseen circumstances happen all the time, especially in an office this big. But then another employee, a grumpy old man from accounts, was suddenly gone, replaced by a young woman in a neatly pressed new suit. The tag in the waste paper basket by her desk had the same dry cleaner's logo on it. One by one, dozens of employees were being mysteriously replaced, and all of the workers, too zombified by their jobs, hadn't even noticed. These new employees could only be one thing, undercover agents. But whose undercover agents remained a mystery. The closest that the intern had got was when he overheard a pair of them saying something about a foundation, whatever that meant. The intern turns around and starts typing on the keypad, gold. And sure enough, quick as a flash, a paper cup appears and out of the nozzle pours a thick, shimmering golden liquid. The woman stares at it in disbelief. It couldn't be. She reaches down to take it, but can't. It's heavy, really heavy. Is that really? He nods. He explains that he hasn't got a clue why it isn't hotter to the touch. It doesn't feel any hotter than a cup of coffee would, or indeed how it doesn't destroy the cup since it's just a regular paper one. But he'd taken it home, poured it into a cake tin, where it solidified into a brick. The jewelers in town took a look at it for him the next day and confirmed that it was the real thing. 24 karat gold, one paper cup worth. The woman takes the cup and types the word in again, hitting enter. Another cup of liquid gold pours out. She does it again, and again. But on the sixth time she hits enter, nothing happens. No air message, nothing. The intern explains that you can only do it 50 times in one go. Then you have to wait for an hour and a half for it to restock. The elevator doors open. Two people in pressed black suits step out through the doors and spy the pair of them immediately. For some reason, the woman's first instinct is to take off running, but she stops herself just in time, trying her best to act cool, with five cups of liquid gold in her hands. From where they are, these must all look like regular cups of coffee she's collecting for a drinks round, but if they get much closer, the agents start walking toward the woman and the intern. All four people in this interaction are doing their absolute best to act casually. None of them are really succeeding. There's a trash can exactly halfway between them all, she needs to get there first and dump the cups before anyone can look inside them. Taking off at a hurried but hopefully not panicked trot, she starts throwing as much corporate jargon at the intern as she can. He falls into step beside her, engaging animatedly in the discussion of quarterly growth and stagnating markets. The trash can's getting closer. It'll be close. The agents stop and block off the corridor. Pretending not to see, the woman keeps walking, dumping the cups in the trash and trying not to think about how many thousands of dollars she's just thrown away. In the most confident and off-handed voice she can, she says, Excuse me, and walks right between the agents and off towards the elevator. As the doors slide closed, she sees the pair of them going over to the coffee machine and looking at it curiously. Do they know? She mutters the words under her breath, trying her best not to let her lips move. No, 
The intern is trembling with fear. Why are they here then? The intern says nothing. Instead, getting out at her floor and walking pointedly over to her desk with her, he jabs a finger on a copy of the day's paper. 5.8 million worth of gold vanishes from locked bank vault. The woman's blood runs cold. She looks around the office for a quiet corner and pulls the intern across to it. So the machine wasn't just making gold from thin air, it was transmuting it from some other location. How much had the intern been stealing? He doesn't answer the question, instead just looking more and more nervous. In just 20 minutes during her lunch break, she had become an accomplice in the largest bank heist her city had seen in living memory, all while standing by a coffee machine. The nerves start to hit her in earnest now. Her eyes dart around the office, looking from face to face. There are a lot of pressed black suits around, a lot of eyes subtly looking back in her direction. She goes to sit at her desk. An hour passes as slowly as molasses. Her nerves build. Another hour. The intern appears at her desk suddenly and tells her the worst possible thing she could hear. He hasn't just been taking gold. Her head whips around to face him. He can't be saying all of this right here. They're being watched. Anything valuable I could think of that you can have in liquid form. I, diamonds don't work. I've tried, but anything liquid. The problem is, it's all clearly come from somewhere. Banks, government facilities, research stations. They must have triangulated that everything going missing has happened near here. She hushes him as quickly as she can, but it's too late. From the subtle movements that employees across the office are making, it's clear that they're onto them. She needs to come up with a plan fast. What can she do? What can she do? She looks this way and that. Only one thing sticks out to her a little red switch on the wall. She punches the fire alarm, and in an instant, the alarm blares throughout the building. Sprinklers blast her with cold, stinking water, and people all across the floor cry out in surprise. The assistant to the regional manager gets up and begins conducting the fire procedure with his usual enthusiasm to the groans of all the employees. In the chaos, the woman grabs her handbag along with the intern's arm and rushes him down the stairs. They push their way through the swarm of drab suits, apologizing the whole way. If anyone follows them here, they'll be breaking cover. Should buy them a moment to... The woman kicks open a side door and drags the intern after her. It's quiet down here. They'll take the back route to the basement. It should be empty down there. She hasn't got the heart to tell the intern that she doesn't have a plan, she's just winging it. Glancing over her shoulder, she spies a couple of faces peering at her through the door they'd just come through. It's the agents that had seen them at the coffee machine earlier. They'll need to be quick. Running down the flight of stairs to the basement, the woman and the intern rush over to the machine, panting hard. She orders him to put in as many orders as he can. The intern looks baffled. What does she mean? She tells him to get as much value as he can carry, preferably something that you can pour into a handbag without it burning through. He struggles to think of anything. He can't do gold, it would be too hot when it left the cup, too heavy. He has an idea and starts typing furiously. Cup after cup pours out of the machine and he puts paper lids on them and he dumps them into her bag. It looks black at first, but there's a slight shimmer to it. Printer ink. It's the most valuable liquid per liter in the world. He saw it on TikTok. But how in the world were they supposed to sell it? But the woman guesses she'll have to worry about that later. The door at the far side of the corridor has opened. Out step the two agents. What are you two doing down here? The fire alarm's going off. The agents drop the facade and draw pistols from beneath their suit jackets. The coffee's that good down here, huh? They don't smile with their joke. The intern tugs at her sleeves. She brushes him off. Not now, she needs to think. It's great. Wow, what a comeback from her. Turns out she's not so hot under pressure. A cup appears in her hand. The intern has shoved it there. She glances down. It's a clear, slightly green liquid, shimmering a little too much in the light. He nods at her. I would drink that if I were you. The agent raises his gun, his partner following suit. Here goes nothing. She slams the drink back in one gulp and raises her arms in the air. Both agents stop dead, aiming down their barrels ready to fire. But the woman suddenly feels an enormous sense of calm washing over her. Agents Jones and Hilton, I would kindly ask that you lower your weapons. My name is Professor Kane. I have clearance level five and am in charge of this operation. The agents both doubt themselves all of a sudden. The name Kane is ringing bells in both of their minds. You don't look much like Professor Kane. Ha! <laughs> Charming. That's because I've been off on maternity leave for the previous few weeks. Childcare will bring out the gray hairs like nothing else. Agent Wilkins and I are taking this opportunity to conduct first-hand research on the nature of this particular SCP, and I would kindly request you give us the time and space to conduct our research. 
Research, I might add, that neither of you have the clearance to be a part of? The two agents look sheepish. They glance at each other, then holster their weapons. With mumbled apologies, they hesitantly make their way back towards the back stairs. As soon as the door closes, the woman swivels round and looks at the intern. What on earth had he given her? The machine answers her question. One cup of knowledge of the entire secret operation. They grin at each other, the intern taking a sip of a matching drink for himself. The knowledge entered both of their minds. They had five minutes to get everything they could from the machine before those two SCP Foundation field agents realized what was happening. The intern looks concerned. How are they going to get all that gold out of here? How are they going to get out of here? The woman grins, pours herself a cup of gold, and tosses it down the mail chute. I reckon that looks big enough for the both of us, don't you? What is it that you want? Not just what you want in this moment. That's fleeting. You get it and move on. Or you don't and you forget. No. What do you want? What do you yearn for? That humming dissatisfaction that underscores every moment of your life. The constant rumbling, always beneath the surface, that you can never put your finger on. Behind your computer monitor, at the bottom of your $4 coffee, that quiet moment when you go to the toilet at a friend's wedding and look at yourself in the mirror, asking, why am I not happy yet? This moment, this object, this feeling that I was looking forward to, why does it feel empty? A night in with your best friends, a promotion at work, a new car, a new house, all empty. So when I ask you again, I want you to be serious. None of that fake surface level fleeting drivel. What is it that you want? What will genuinely make you happy? The words buzz around the student's head. He hasn't listened to a word of this lecture, not for a moment. Last night's therapy session had clearly struck a bit too close to home. He'd never expected this new therapist to be so direct. What was it that he really wanted? The student looks down at his laptop. He'd really wanted that. He'd spent months researching it, holding off on buying other models, waiting and saving up for the perfect computer. And here it is, with the same old boring lecture notes on the screen as his old one. Within a week, he'd been back online looking up new phones. Here he is, 21 years old already, and studying for a degree he doesn't really care about. Surrounded by happy, smiling students who are all clearly going to be far more successful and happy than he'll ever be. Beautiful people everywhere he looks. People who know how to dress well, know how to have a conversation, how to smile and laugh with friends, how to have friends in the first place. His therapist is right. What's he got to be happy about? That dissatisfied humming running through his life is steadily turning into a roar. What would actually make him happy? The more he thinks about it, the more the sense of dread creeps in. What has he actually got to look forward to in life? What can fill that void? The lecture is over. He hadn't even realized. Everyone around him is already on their feet, putting notepads and laptops into bags, chatting away with their friends. The student doesn't have anyone else in his row. He's somehow picked the only row in the lecture hall with just one person in it. No, that's not the case. This is the only row in the lecture with just one person in it, because he picked it. His only company on this row? A fly. A fly that had been following him around all week. What's the point? He looks at his laptop screen. Empty. His phone buzzes. It's his mom. He declines the call. Swinging his bag onto his shoulder, the student makes his way to the door. A group of guys up ahead are chatting loudly as they open it. One of them half glances back over his shoulder. He stops in the doorway, holding the door open. The student looks around. No one else was with him. Who's this guy holding the door open for? You okay? The guy asks, looking straight at the student. His eyes are very blue. The student rushes through the doorway, muttering a thank you on his way through. His phone starts to ring again in his pocket. He sits up alone that night. He does the same most nights. Even if he wanted to, he wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Sharing a house with seven other people, there's a party happening in one part of the house pretty much every night. The thumping bass is the only sound to reach the student as he sits quietly at his window, looking out at the bags of trash lining the street and the couple across from him arguing on their porch. 
The little fly in his room is the only one keeping him company, not buzzing around or trying to escape through the glass, just sitting there next to him, watching the world go by. What is it that you really want? The words ring around in his head again. Tell me what will make you truly happy. What is it? I think... I think I just want someone to love me, the student says quietly. He sits quietly by the window for a few more minutes, not noticing as the little fly next to him catches fire and rolls onto its back, legs curled in the air. The student just goes to bed. Nothing's ever going to change, is it? A week later, the student is back in that same lecture again. He arrived early this week, sitting down and unpacking his stuff a good 15 minutes before they were due to start. Surreptitiously as he can, the student glances over at the door every time he hears it swing open. It's the usual procession of beautiful, happy people, each one dressed exactly how they want, personalities, goals, and aspirations filling each of them. He looks down at his outfit. Gray. The lecture starts, but the student still can't quite focus. He keeps his head half-turned towards the door the whole time, waiting. Ten minutes go by. Nothing. He slumps down in his chair and starts taking notes, just as the door softly creeps open behind him, making a gentle hushing noise on the carpet. The student turns. There he is, the guy from before with the blue eyes. The student tries his best to swallow his grin. He's the only one in his row. If he can just get the guy's attention, maybe he'll come and sit with him. But no, that's a stupid plan. Why would anyone want to come and... The bag lands in the seat next to him. The student turns to see those same piercing blue eyes. Anyone sitting here? The guy whispers. The student opens his mouth to reply, but the words get stuck. After a second, he manages to shake his head. The guy with the blue eyes grins and sinks into the seat. After a moment, he asks if he can borrow a pen. That's funny. The student can see a pen right there in the side pocket of the guy's bag. Why would this guy choose to sit with him? There are plenty of free seats in this lecture hall. They're everywhere. One thing's for sure. The student definitely can't talk to this guy afterwards. No way. He's too weird. It'll be obvious. No one ever wants to have a conversation with him. Everyone he talks to is always sidling their way out of the room after just a couple of minutes. Besides, what if this guy finds out what he's really like? That he's been seeing a therapist. Not just a therapist. That would be pretty normal. Normal people do that. No, what if this guy found out that his therapist was a fly? A fly that had been following him around, that he'd been talking to every night before bed. A fly that had been asking him what his deepest desires were. A fly that he'd woken up to find dead and burnt on his windowsill this morning. Nope, no way is he going to have a conversation with this guy. It would just be a disaster. There's no other option. He has to call his mom. As soon as the lecture is over, he'll call her and deal with whatever it is she has to say. He takes the phone out of his pocket and stealthily gets his mom's contact details up, ready to hit the call button as soon as the lecture finishes. There, the final slide. The student hits dial and immediately turns away from the blue-eyed guy next to him, getting up and putting it to his ear. He shoulders his bag and marches out of the lecture hall, not looking back until he reaches the little square of grass outside where he sits. His heart doesn't stop hammering until he's sitting there. His mom takes a long time to pick up. When she does, it's clear that she's been crying. Not this again. The student swallows and prepares for her to start ranting. Only she doesn't. Instead, she just asks where he is and if she can drive over and get a coffee with him. He says yes, hangs up, and looks down at the phone, brow furrowed. What she got to say to him this time? A shadow falls over him. Turning, the student just sees two blue eyes. The guy is holding out the borrowed pen, a gentle smile on his face. His mom doesn't come for coffee in the end. Instead, she invites herself over to his house. It's the first time she's visited. As they make their way up all the flights of stairs to his floor, the student holds his breath, waiting for her to start complaining about the cigarette butts, ashtrays, and pizza boxes lining the hallways. But she doesn't. She doesn't say a word. He closes the door to his room behind her, and she lets out a sympathetic little sigh looking around. He probably should have tidied first. Here it comes. He can feel it. She's about to start lecturing him on his dirty clothes, leftover dishes, his unmade bed. But no. She just quietly picks up a sweater and starts folding it. Then another. As she tidies his room, she shoots him a sad little smile. This house really won't do. He explains to her that it's all he can afford at the moment. Well, then let me help you so you can find somewhere better. What's going on here? He doesn't know how to react. This is surely one of her games. Any second she's going to lash out at him. But no. She just gently brushes the dead fly off the windowsill into the trash and turns to him. They stand across the room from each other, the same way they always have. 
eight feet between them. Plenty of space, not too close. She closes the distance and pulls him in for a tight hug. As his mom buries her head in his chest, he notices for the first time how short she really is. Has she always been that height? Didn't she used to tower over him? Her muffled voice speaks into his chest, right into where his heart is beating. I'm so sorry for how I responded before. I didn't know what to say. You're my son, and I'm proud of you. I always have been. You love who you love. Don't let anyone take that away from you. Even your silly old mother. For a long time, the two of them stand there, crying together. It is a busy week moving everything into his new apartment. It's still a pretty basic place, but at least it's his own. The neighbors are quiet, the street is clean, and there are no flies. By the time the student sits down for his lecture, he's completely exhausted. He barely registers the bag landing on the floor next to him and the guy sitting in the seat. He's so tired, in fact, that the conversation catches him off guard. He hadn't prepared anything to say. But suddenly, they're talking. About the weather at first. It's sunnier now. Then about the class. Then why they chose to study here. Then their teenage years. Then their homes and families. The lecture starts, but the two of them keep muttering away to each other in hushed tones. The student cracks a joke, and the guy with blue eyes laughs. Properly laughs. He isn't just being polite, he actually found it funny. So funny that the lecturer tells the pair of them off, which just makes them laugh more. Is this what it's like? To be one of the beautiful, happy people? Days go by, and the student wakes up every morning expecting it to be over. He's going to wake up any minute now, and he'll be back in his old house with a talking fly waiting for him by the window. But he doesn't. It's sunny, day after day, week after week, no flies in sight. He calls his mom. He doesn't just pick up the phone to her, he actually starts to call her. He goes to parties, discovers he likes white wine, and finds out what it's like to have a bit too much of it. He has his first kiss and opens his eyes to see a pair of perfect blue ones staring back at him. He makes friends, more friends than he can count. Friends who text him asking to hang out, who help him move house, then move house again, and who fill up rows and rows of seats the day he gets married to the man he loves. The man who loves him back. Is this what it feels like? Is this happiness? Maybe, just maybe, this is it. Until one day, the man wakes up. Everything's perfect. The sun is still shining, he can hear his daughter's squeals from downstairs, his world is still happy. Except for one thing. His ear hurts. Not that much, but there's a little something, a kind of dull itch deep in his ear canal. The other ear starts to hurt as he makes his morning coffee. He should probably go to the doctor about it. He'll book that this week. But by that night, he knows he probably shouldn't wait any longer. He lies awake deep into the night, feeling his lungs tightening. You're not supposed to feel your lungs, are you? But it's not just his lungs, it's his throat too, and his bowels. All of a sudden, his stomach starts convulsing. He throws off the sheets and rushes into the bathroom, not quite making it to the toilet. His vomit splatters across the tiles. He must be getting delirious. That can't be right. It looks like his vomit is moving, wriggling, and crawling. His husband appears behind him, switching on the light. The two of them stare in horror at the writhing maggots covering the bathroom floor. The x-rays and MRIs paint a grueling picture. Each progressive scan over the next couple of days looks worse than the last. What had once been healthy flesh and organ tissue steadily has deeper rivets chaotically eaten into it. The maggots work their way through the man's throat, lungs, stomach, sinuses, ears, bowels, and urethra. In some places, they run out of flesh and end up burrowing their way out of the surface of his skin. By the time the maggots mature into flies, the man is on his deathbed. Excessive blood loss, organ failure, and multiple infections have worn his body down to a husk. There's nothing left to be done for him. All that the man's husband, children, mother, and countless friends can do is stand by and watch, as one by one, thousands of flies emerge from the body of the man they'd once loved so dearly. Heartbreaking as it may be, this is the sad reality of what you sign up for when you make a deal with SCP-3063, known informally as The Fly. This SCP on the surface seems like one of the most harmless that the Foundation has encountered, taking the appearance of a common house fly. It has no extraordinary physical properties, nothing apparent to distinguish it from any other fly, and yet, it is one of the most powerful entities with an apparent ability to somehow alter reality itself. It is believed that SCP-3063 only exists in one instance at a time, though this is very difficult to prove given the sheer number of flies that exist around the world. As soon as one instance of SCP-3063 dies, a new one seems to manifest in a random location. 
Naturally, this makes studying the fly very difficult indeed. As far as the Foundation is aware, the fly communicates with its human target telepathically. It interrogates them, trying to discover what they want most in the world. It will then offer the individual that exact thing. If they refuse, it will make increasingly grand offers, tempting them with greater and greater promises until they accept. When I said this was one of the most powerful known SCPs, I was not exaggerating, because this fly does not make empty promises. Do you want to become a millionaire? You might wake up tomorrow to a number of anonymous bank transfers or a handful of lottery tickets pushed through your letterbox. Do you want to become an opera singer? The next time you sing in the shower, you'll find a whole new voice coming from your chest. Who knows, you may have left the window open and a superstar agent could be strolling by your house at that exact moment. Whatever it is that you tell the fly that you want, it will be granted. The little insect will catch fire and die straight away, appearing somewhere else in the world, ready to start talking to someone else. Your answered wish may not always take the form you expect, but it will be given to you. Just like our student finding love everywhere he went for the next six years. Or, to be more precise, 2,376 days. You see, as soon as you make a deal with this fly, the clock is ticking. For 2,376 days, you will be free to enjoy your dream coming true, no strings attached. Until one day, you wake up with a little bit of discomfort, like something growing inside of you. Eggs, anything from 5,000 to 20,000 in number, will suddenly appear throughout your body. In your digestive system, respiratory system, and even your muscle fibers, small maggots will be born comprising all known to Terra species. They will steadily eat away at your body, feeding their way out of you and growing into regular adult flies as they emerge. Most individuals die from multiple organ failures during this stage. It can often be difficult to identify the exact cause of death, as the attack on the body's central systems is so absolute, devastating, and swift. If the individual dies before the 2376th day, then the process is halted and the flies die along with them. Attempts to contain SCP-3063 have all proven unsuccessful. To date, six members of SCP Foundation personnel have been targeted by the fly. Each of them have tried to make a different wish to contain the fly, but each has had a loophole exposed. Senior researcher Elizabeth Gao requested the death of SCP-3063, which the fly interpreted as the death of that manifestation, combusted and returned in another instance. Senior researcher David Roberts asked for the permanent containment of SCP-3063. The fly then stood totally still, allowing itself to be taken into secure containment below Site-63. But sure enough, after 2,376 days, the researcher died and the fly was discovered to still be manifesting around the world. It again had interpreted its containment to refer to just that current instance of its body. A later researcher requests knowledge of how SCP-3063 functions, at which point the fly combusted and a document containing all known information about SCP-3063, everything I am telling you now, appeared before the researcher who later died. The penultimate test conducted by SCP personnel proved to be the most chilling. Dr. Patrick McGann asked the fly if it could provide clear, understandable knowledge of SCP-3063 other than knowledge currently possessed by the SCP Foundation. The results of that exact experiment and the next one were provided for him, including details of his own death, which he immediately fulfilled. Either the fly has some precognizant abilities or is able to directly control events in the world, or both. The final experiment was conducted even though the fly had already provided the results in detail ahead of time. Dr. Jonathan Mabry simply asked, is there even a choice, before suffering a severe pulmonary embolism and dying on the way to the hospital. Research indicates that SCP-3063 has been operating for over 4,000 years, with evidence of instances being discovered as far back as early Canaanite settlements. However, many theorize that the fly has been with us a lot longer than that. Unless future containment efforts are more successful, SCP-3063 will likely remain one of the most powerful and prolific entities outside of containment. So next time you see a fly buzzing around your room, it might be in your best interest to leave it alone. Uncle S is the worst. Always has been. Every time the two of them go over to his house, he just sits in his room all day on his computer, he doesn't talk to them, just grunts occasionally, and never cooks them any food. The siblings have learned at this point to tell their mom to pack them lunch. Worst of all though, Uncle S is just a little strange. He has all these posters up all over his house, some of them with underdressed ladies on them. The brother's little sister always covers his eyes to stop him from looking. 
But there are other posters too, weirder ones, with these symbols on them and quotes written underneath. Neither of the kids can really read enough to know what the quotes mean, but their mom always gets very tense whenever they ask about them. She says they are something to do with politics, whatever that means. You know someone's weird when even their mom agrees. Uncle S is just weird. But there is a big upside to being at his house. The two of them can just sit downstairs in the lounge playing video games. He's got a big TV and a bunch of different game consoles, most of which are older than the two of them. This week, he's even got a new box next to the TV. It's full of old wires, controllers, and games. And when they say old, they mean old. It all smells of dust. The brother reaches inside and pulls out a big gray box. The top half of it is lighter gray and the bottom darker. There's some red writing along the front of it. He carefully spells it out in his head before saying the words out loud. He doesn't want his little sister to know that he struggles with long words. Nintendo Enter Entertain Entertainment System. His little sister huffs and sits on the sofa. She doesn't want to play that stupid thing. It looks old, and the dust is making her sneeze. This whole house is dirty and gross. The TV and games consoles are the only nice thing in here. Why would she want to play with the gross one? The brother ignores her and tries to plug it into the TV. Wait, where's the HDMI on the back of this thing? He gives up pretty quickly. On the sofa, his sister switches on the TV and grabs the Xbox controller. The familiar cuphead music fills the room. They turn it down quickly. Can't be annoying Uncle S, who's sitting upstairs on his computer. Why does she always want to play Cuphead? It annoys her brother so much, they can't even beat the first level, it's way too hard. She chooses two-player, and Cuphead and Mugman both appear in the field, Sunflower Men parachuting down around them. You're up! The announcer yells on the screen. His sister starts running along as Cuphead, but bumps into the end of the screen. They need to both play together for this to work, but the brother isn't interested today. He reaches into the Nintendo box and rummages around, finding something that fits perfectly into his hand. Something with a trigger. No way. He pulls the strange toy gun out of the box and holds it in the air triumphantly. It's gray, matching the NES console, with an orange trigger and the word Nintendo written on the side in that same red writing. A cord dangles out of the bottom of it. Immediately he spins around and points it at his sister and shoots. Nothing happens. No noise, no lights. She just sits there and scowls at him. Fine. He gets up off the floor and grabs the second Xbox controller. They run past the sunflower men and shoot the toadstool, but die at the first purple flower. Great. The boy is sick of this game. He doesn't want to keep playing it every week. He wants to play with the gun. Imagine what games he could play with that. He picks it back up. Cuphead and Mugman respawn, and the music starts over again. Very carefully, he peers down the barrel and takes aim at Cuphead. He squeezes the trigger. Bam! A puff of smoke, and Cuphead turns into a red ghost, pink heart beating. Wait, how did that happen? His sister didn't run into anything. She yells at him. That wasn't fair. The brother is very confused. He looks back down at the gun. It wasn't even plugged in, and it wasn't an Xbox gun. So, how come it worked? He points it at Mugman and shoots. Bam! Another puff of smoke, and Mugman's ghost floats off the screen. The menu pops up, and the brother hits retry. The level starts again. The music kicks off, and the announcer yells, but Cuphead and Mugman aren't there. His sister wiggles the stick a few times. Nothing. The characters don't appear. What are you doing? Keep playing, she yells at him. But the brother can't see any characters left on the screen. Why is she pretending to see them still? Footsteps creak the floorboards above their heads. Uh-oh, now they've done it. Uncle S appears on the stairs, scowling at them both. Immediately, each sibling points at the other one and blames them. Uncle S doesn't say a word. Instead, he glares at them as he walks over and snatches away their controllers. He turns and goes back upstairs. No more video games. No fair. The two of them slump on the couch, arms crossed, not saying anything. The NES zapper sits between them. Looks like they'll just have to watch TV instead. It's the brother's turn to choose something. He goes on Netflix and puts on Avatar The Last Airbender, her least favorite show. The opening credits roll, telling them all about the Fire Nation's attack. His sister snatches the gun up from the seat and points it at the screen, aiming at all the characters that pop up. Her brother ignores her. She's just being silly again. The episode starts. 
Aang is in a city in the Earth Nation, walking around a market surrounded by... His sister squeals. He looks at the TV, confused. Nothing has really happened. The characters are just standing around at the market, talking. But his sister stares at the screen wide-eyed, almost a little scared-looking. What's she doing? She points at the screen in amazement and says that Aang is dead. She pointed the gun at him and shot, and now he's dead. Yeah, right. Aang is perfectly fine. He's standing right there talking to Katara. The brother snatches the gun back and fires it at the screen. Bam! A gunshot rings out through the town square, and Aang crumples to the ground. Katara screams and runs over to him. She tries desperately to wake him up, but there's no use. He just lies there dead in the square. No blood, of course. This is a children's show, after all. Katara starts sobbing desperately and looks imploringly at the screen. The brother's mouth hangs open. Seriously? That's how the show ends? He thought there were a bunch of episodes left. How are they supposed to defeat the Fire Nation now? Who'd be the next Avatar? He looks over at his sister. Her mouth is hanging open still as well. Very hesitantly, he raises the barrel again and takes aim at one of the market stalls. He pulls the trigger. Bam! A watermelon explodes into red mush. The characters all jump back and run for cover. Sokka peers out from behind one of the carts, staring straight at them before ducking away again. This show is weird. I don't want to watch it anymore, the brother says, throwing the gun back down on the sofa and pressing back on Netflix. He's going to pretend like that didn't happen. His sister snatches the remote out of his hand and goes across to HBO Max. She puts on Roadrunner and Wild E. Coyote. That's a safe option. They've seen every episode of that. No surprise endings, no characters dying, and most importantly, they both like it. The episode opens the same as it always does. Roadrunner is out running around the canyon. Wild E. Coyote has a new plan. He's going to paint what looks like a tunnel into the side of the cliff and make Roadrunner run straight into it foolproof. But suddenly, his little sister has snatched the gun up off the sofa and is firing it here, there, and everywhere at the screen. But that look of horror is gone. She's laughing. No fair. He can't see what she's enjoying so much. It's just a normal episode. So he snatches the gun back from her and points it at Roadrunner. He squeezes the trigger. Bam! But Roadrunner just sidesteps the bullet and gives his trademark, meep meep. He fires again. Bam! 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 But every bullet seems to miss Roadrunner entirely, who dashes off into the sunset as out from the bush creeps a very injured Wild E. Coyote, bullet wounds all over his body. He scowls at the brother and trudges off down the road, walking straight into the fake tunnel he painted. After a moment, the brother breaks out in laughter too. This gun is amazing. What should they watch next? Who have they always wanted to shoot? What if they shoot a hole in the dome around Sandy the Squirrel's house? Or kill the Shredder? Could Sonic outrun a bullet? Or what about all those silly children's shows his sister watches? Could he finally get those characters to stop singing all the time? He's laughing so loud, in fact, that he doesn't hear the footsteps coming down the stairs. He doesn't realize Uncle S is there until the shadow falls over him. Having fun? The brother tries to explain as best he can, but the gun is already out of his hands. The TV is off, and the remote disappears into Uncle S's pocket. In a grump, the two children sit there bickering quietly until their mom comes to get them an hour later. That evening, Uncle S is doing the same thing he always does. He lies on the couch, feet kicked up, instant ramen in his hands. The news is on, running a lame story about the president visiting some kindergarten in the run-up to the next round of primaries. What a joke. Uncle S lies there seething, thinking to himself, as if that guy cares about any of those kids. If he did, he'd be clamping down much harder on the borders to stop foreigners from coming and ruining their futures. How are these true-blooded Americans going to have any chance in life when their own country is being overrun? He switches over the channel. There's some cartoon playing. He hates cartoons even more. He holds the NES zapper aloft. He's been carrying it around all afternoon for some reason. Imagine if it was a real gun. Without thinking, he points the zapper at the TV and pulls the trigger. Bam! A gunshot makes him jump out of his skin. Was that outside? He looks back at the TV. The cartoon character is ducking down at the bottom of the frame, a bullet hole in the wall behind him. Oh, thank God. He was just in the show. Not a real gunshot. The character wags a finger at the screen. Careful now, the character says. If you keep doing that, the SCP Foundation is going to come and get you. Huh? SCP Foundation? That sounds dumb. This is why he doesn't watch cartoons. Animation is for kids. He flicks back over to the news. The president is still surrounded by children. 
Imagine if he could just point this gun at the president, right between his smug little eyes, gently squeeze the trigger, and bam! The shot makes him jump so violently that he spills boiling ramen all over his chest. He howls and leaps to his feet, trying to shake all the noodles off. Great, that was his last t-shirt. He's been wearing it for four days now, didn't even need to wash it yet. What was that noise, anyway? He glances up at the screen, and his jaw drops. The President of the United States is lying dead at the front of the kindergarten classroom. Blood trickles out from under his body. Secret Service agents swarm around him, shielding him from view and yelling at the cameraman to shut that thing off. The news cuts back to a distressed anchor. She's trying to talk, but is so overwhelmed by what she's just witnessed that the words aren't really coming. A breaking news headline crawls across the bottom of the screen. Breaking, the President of the United States assassinated. No way. Uncle S drops the gun and stands there panting. He didn't do that, did he? No. No, of course he didn't. That was a coincidence, all it was, just a coincidence. If it was real, then he would point the gun at the anchor right now, pull the trigger, and bam! Her head rocks back. Blood sprays the back wall of the newsroom. The feed cuts out, and an ad break starts. It's some stupid infomercial. Only, the actors in it keep glancing nervously at the camera and slightly hunch behind tables and objects when they get the chance. Uncle S just keeps standing there staring at the screen all the way through the night. Two weeks later, Uncle S is running out of food. He ran out of ramen a couple of days ago, beans yesterday, and today he's having the last scraps of moldy bread. He hasn't left the house in all that time. He can't anymore. He's the most wanted man in the United States. Every night, the news is the same. His mugshot was plastered on the screen appealing to friends, families, witnesses, anyone to come forward and identify this man. Somehow, nobody has yet. His sister tried to call a handful of times, but he didn't pick up. Before long, he just disconnected his phone line entirely. The silence is better, helps him focus on his work. He's drawn up a list. In fact, he'd started to draw it up before he'd ever discovered the gun. On it are the names of every politician, business owner, media puppet, fake news spreading Illuminati shill he can think of. He just sits there hopping between TV channels, gun at the ready. He's got his laptop down here too, and he just spends most of the day searching through YouTube for different videos of people he's been wanting to kill. He'd be lying if he said there weren't a few annoying YouTubers that had made the list too. You know the ones he's talking about. The world is starting to fall apart out there. With the president gone, along with half of Congress and most major propaganda peddlers, it's all starting to unravel just like he'd always wanted. The military is being drafted in to suppress riots across the country, but doing little to contain it all. Random shootings keep breaking out, leading to more and more chaos. It will be painful for a while, Uncle S knows that, but in time, they'll learn their lesson. He just wonders how long he'll have. He can't keep getting away with this forever. Something's gonna give soon. It's got to. They have his mugshot, they have his name, and yet, no one is surrounding his house. He knows that because he set up webcams all around the perimeter of the house. He has the live feed open on his laptop. If anyone comes within 20 feet of the property, they're getting a neat little hole in the front of their head and getting the back of it blown into a hundred red, pink, and white chunks to give his weeds a bit of iron. In fact, he knows they'll be on their way soon. He knows that because some rat from his blog will have told them. He's been documenting everything on here, masking his IP address first, Uncle S has been recording and boasting about each and every kill anonymously as green text. At first, he kept it coy, writing in riddles and rhymes about the public figures he was murdering, but now he is up to such a high tempo that they're just a bullet point list of names. Of course, his posts have all been flooded with trolls acting like he hadn't done anything at all, pretending like the president is still alive along with everyone else, photoshopping screenshots to make it look like they were getting new photos of these people. Great trolling, they almost had him doubting his own eyes at times. But every night, the news channels didn't lie. Another 232 public figures dead, shot through the head by an unknown gunman. But tonight, they'll be coming for him. The SCP Foundation. They'll be on their way. The characters on the TV have told him all he needs to know about them. He can't hide here forever. He almost wants them to come, really. He very explicitly made a threat tonight. A threat about a deadly surprise under the stadium at the Super Bowl. They're not going to ignore that. Any moment now. He's ready for the shootout. He has his webcam set up to cover every inch of his surrounding yards. Any SWAT team or SCP agent that gets close will get gunned down immediately. Their only option would be to hit him with a drone strike. 
And what a way to go that would be. No one would ever forget him. He'd be a martyr for the cause. They'd build statues in his honor. He licks his lips and stares at the feed. Nothing. For almost 45 minutes. Nothing. There, a shadow crosses the corner of the frame. Then another. A gun points into the shot. They're here. A team of them by the looks of things. He can see their shadows lining up along the sidewalk out by the front of his house. He'll wait. He's gonna wait for them to all line up nicely in the shot, then open fire. He's been practicing so much that his aim's gotten pretty good. Clean shot to the head, one by one. Now! Bam! 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 The gunshots ring out one after the other as he fires at the laptop screen. He catches each of the SCP agents cleanly through the head, one after the other. A couple break for cover, but there's no hope. Bam! 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 He picks each of them off. He makes sure to shoot the last man in the leg and sits quietly for a moment, watching him crawl across the lawn. Uncle S raises the barrel and points it at the man's head. He squeezes the trigger. Crash! The front door flies open and Foundation field agents flood his house. But how can that be possible? He just killed all of them outside the front door. He watched them die. How are they still here? He looks incredulously out of the front door into the yard. No blood, no bodies, no evidence of what had just happened. The SCP agents swarm around him, guns raised and barking orders. He snaps back to reality and panics, throwing his arms in the air and letting the toy gun drop limply to the floor. I did it. I killed the President of the United States. It was me. He starts crying as they handcuff him and press his face into the carpet. The agents question him, confused. What is he talking about? The President is alive and well. He's in the middle of his next election campaign, doing better than ever in the polls. I killed them. I killed them all. It was me. Again, the agents are perplexed. As the uniformed men drag him outside and throw him into the back of the van, he can't help but wonder why everything seems so peaceful out here. Where has his apocalypse gone? The doors slam shut. In this moment, I am very much hoping that no one viewing this video is in possession of SCP-674, or an equivalent weapon currently unknown to the Foundation. You see, while SCP-674, otherwise known as the Exposition Gun, poses no threat to me in the real world, it could have a nasty effect on your perception of reality. The Exposition Gun appears to be an entirely normal Nintendo Entertainment System zapper. As far as the Foundation can tell, it matches up perfectly with other models released in North America from around 1985. You can take the zapper apart, examine each plastic and electronic component individually, reassemble it, and you will fail to see anything out of the ordinary for this video game peripheral. And yet, if you were to hold this gun up to your screen right now, pointed at me, and fire, you would hear a gunshot ring out and watch me collapse in my chair, dead. For the rest of the duration of the video, you would watch me sit here in silence. Videos would continue to upload to this channel, but each of them would probably just show my corpse as it slowly rots away in this chair. To anyone else, however, it would be business as usual as I uncover more horrifying, unnerving, fascinating, and bizarre tales from the SCP Foundation. The exposition gun only works on its user, forever altering the reality they perceive through whichever digital screen they fire at. If they shoot the president, as Mr. S did, then in the continuity of any news program they watch, the president will forever be dead. The same applies to fictional shows as well. If the main character dies off, a sidekick steps in to take their place, and the story changes accordingly. It is to be noted that each show or movie follows its own internal logic, however. The children were unable to shoot Roadrunner because he always gets away. But in classic cartoon fashion, all of their missed bullets ended up hitting a very forlorn Wild E. Coyote. In this context, however, the gun was proved not to be fatal, as in the universe of that show, explosions, electrocutions, falls from cliffs, and drownings can never kill the coyote. So of course, a gunshot would be no different. What is most interesting, however, is the gun's apparent awareness of the SCP Foundation. Users who fire the gun into the camera frequently will find characters soon breaking the fourth wall and warning them to stop it soon for fear of being caught by the Foundation. Perhaps most chilling and still unexplained to this day was Mr. S's ultimate demise. Between rounds of questioning, he was locked in a cell with a lone security camera watching him. Mr. S was observed conversing with the camera frequently, apparently hearing replies, though none could be heard in any of the recordings. Over time, these debates grew more and more aggressive until, all of a sudden, he was shot down in his cell. Researchers and agents rushed in, but were too late. 
Three 38 caliber bullets were lodged in his chest, with no evidence of a shooter in sight. The man died on the scene, and researchers have since been wary about experimenting too much with the exposition gun. The mobile task agent weeps in terror as the nightmarish cartoon figures surround him. In the middle of the bright pink, whimsical town pulled out of your childhood fever dreams. Deformed childhood beasts drink greedily from a fountain overflowing with blood. But the agent doesn't fear them. He fears Mr. Hister, the huge looming figure in the yellow cloak, brimming with tendrils, and that awful face beneath the hood, smiling its rotting smile. All around them, children stand trance-like for the ceremony, ready to receive their final judgment, as up above, a door made of mirror floats, surrounded by the suspended floating bodies of the people who weren't so lucky. Mr. Hister leans in. He's got a question to ask, and if the MTF agent can't answer it, something horrible beyond imagination is going to happen to him. That's just how it is when you're dealing with SCP-5853. SCP-5853 refers to a line of packaged taffy candies. Each package contains two candies, one blue with a raspberry flavor and one red with a cherry flavor. The blue candy appears to have no anomalous effects or adverse effects at all aside from getting stuck in one's teeth. However, the red candy is a different story. Anyone who consumes the red candy and recites a key phrase will be teleported to an extra-dimensional shape seemingly identical to the location of Tiki Taffy Town, a 90s-era television show that advertised the candy and has been designated SCP-5853-A. It was the UIU, a branch of the FBI specialized in investigating paranormal occurrences, who first identified the anomaly after they noticed a correlation between the airing of SCP-5853-A episodes and the disappearances of children. The show and its corresponding candy have been linked to approximately 3,500 child disappearances between the years of 1994 and 1999. As the UIU looked into unexplained disappearances during these years, a peculiar pattern began to emerge among several cases. The missing child was most recently seen in or entering a kitchen pantry. The only evidence left behind was a pile of open Tiki Taffy wrappers, specifically the blue raspberry variety. Shortly before their disappearance, the child was watching an episode of the show featuring the character Mr. Hister, and the missing child's parent could hear the show's theme music just before the child vanished. After a UIU operative's child joined the list of missing kids, the case was turned over to the SCP Foundation, along with all of the UIU's findings up to that point. Though episodes of Tiki Taffy Town can no longer be accessed by the public or by anyone outside of specific Foundation-approved testing, there are descriptions of the show's five main characters, or entities, included in the official file. They range from standard children's entertainment fare to imagery that is… deeply disturbing. First, there is the fatherly, patient Mr. Squibbles, a bipedal humanoid with the head of a plush octopus and a wardrobe consisting of khaki trousers and a red sweater vest. He is responsible for imparting each episode's lesson. Next, there is Mrs. Bobble, a stereotypical clown with blue hair, white makeup, a red nose, and oversized, multicolored clothing. She acts as the questioner of the episode's theme or lesson, raising these questions with Mr. Squibbles. The source of mischief in Tiki Taffy Town is Kizzy Wink, a small entity resembling a bipedal feline with humanoid hands and an oversized head. Though the entity is mischievous, it is also benign and largely childlike in its behavior. Kizzywink has a companion named Franzipans, a small, round, plushy avian with a hammer in place of its beak. Acting as an annoying sidekick to Kizzywink, the entity will fly around the screen and hit the other entities with its hammer beak as a form of slapstick comedy. And then there is the infamous Mr. Hister. This entity is not depicted as overtly hostile, but its appearance is the most troubling in the show. This humanoid entity stands approximately 2.3 meters tall and wears a long, golden-yellow robe with a hood. The entity propels itself through the world with tentacles that emerge from beneath its cloak. Any attempts to produce an official description of the entity's face have proven difficult, due to the notable video distortion effect caused when the entity enters the frame. The closest current description of its face describes it as resembling a misshapen, tumorous human skull. 
A standard Mr. Hister episode of SCP-5853-A begins like most children's shows, with vivid colors, pleasant lighting, and cheerful music, as the main cast teaches standard lessons such as how to tie your shoes, why it's important to brush your teeth, and the value of honesty. When Mr. Hister enters the frame, however, everything changes. The video quality dulls, the colors become oversaturated to the point of becoming almost nausea-inducing, and the contrast decreases dramatically. The visuals aren't the only thing that change in Mr. Hister's presence. The subject matter also shifts in tone, as Mr. Hister torments the rest of the characters with nihilistic and distressing lessons such as, your parents will soon die, and so will you, and I feel nothing but the nothingness, or the particularly evocative, you may not believe in the slaughter, but the slaughter believes in you. When Mr. Hister leaves the scene, he always recites this phrase, I shall now be departing to the land of right, with the truth of red to be my might. This phrase is thought to be related to the various child disappearances attributed to the show. On January 4, 2000, lead researcher Frank Monroe conducted the first test involving SCP-5853-A. Accompanied by junior researchers Tracy Klaus and Morgan Eskew, and supervised by Ethics Committee consultant Jennifer Lamb, Monroe began the test with D-Class 643980 restrained to a detainment chair in the middle of an observation room, placed in front of a television set. D-643980 was also hooked up to standard medical equipment to measure his vitals, while the junior researchers scanned infrared, ultraviolet, and other frequency wavelengths of the television program for any anomalous activity. With this setup in place, lead researcher Monroe signaled for the test to begin. The television was switched on and began to play Tiki Taffy Town Season 1 Episode 3, the first on-screen appearance of Mr. Hister. As the episode began, everything proceeded normally, aside from a small increase in Hume levels. As it progressed, however, the D-Class became increasingly agitated, his heart rate and perspiration increasing. He demanded to know why the show was chosen, explaining that he had childhood memories of the program. His younger brother used to watch the show all the time, until he disappeared. Upon hearing this, Ethics Committee consultant Jennifer Lamb became visibly distressed, but advised the research team to proceed with the test in spite of this unforeseen emotional component. After the episode finished, D643980 was freed from his torso restraints and given a microphone, earpiece, receiver, and shoulder camera mount. He was then given a package of SCP-5853, at which point he remarked that he ate them as a child, but only ever ate the raspberry flavor, while his brother preferred the cherry. He was instructed to eat the cherry piece, then recite the phrase, Flesh is not the truth. At this point, the theme song of Tiki Taffy Town filled the room, and the D-Class vanished from sight, disappearing from the observation room altogether. Dr. Monroe was able to maintain communication with D-643980 via the microphone and receiver, and the research team monitored his video feed. The D-Class began in a dark place, with one single stream of light splitting the center field of view. After some resistance, he continued into the unknown, stumbling out of Mr. Squibble's treasure chest. Upon exiting the chest, the larger landscape could be seen, an exact replica of the Tiki Taffy Town set with a blank white backdrop covering any areas not usually seen by the audience. As the members of the main cast, with the exception of Mr. Hister, entered the area, the D-Class hid in the chest. The four chattered excitedly about an upcoming town meeting before Mr. Squibbles opened the chest and discovered the D-Class hiding inside. He was instructed to engage with the entities until the Foundation could come up with an appropriate extraction plan. The D-Class became distressed and swore, prompting Mrs. Bobble to turn a glowing red until Mr. Squibbles calmed her down. Kizzy Wink asked the D-Class his name, and he answered that it was Davy. At this point, the entities instructed Davy to follow them to the town meeting, where he would be their esteemed guest. Together, they left the house, entering an area made up of the miniature town from the show's opening sequence, only grown to full scale. In the background was the same vacant white backdrop, as well as seemingly infinite copies of the same town landscape. Davy and the group followed a long road toward a cobblestone town square. As the research team watched the video feed, they could see that other pathways in the background were occupied by their own versions of the main cast of characters, all walking toward the same central location. These groups were accompanied, much to the horror of the research team, by small children. 
Each of the houses along the path was printed with a number corresponding to an episode of Tiki Taffy Town that featured Mr. Hister. According to the research team's calculations, this amounted to 31 episodes of the show that were actively able to steal children. Dr. Monroe suggested sending in a mobile task force, but Jennifer Lamb refused to sign off on the request, concerned about the unknown nature of the location and the potential ramifications of sending MTF members inside. While the research team was debating about the next steps, Davy and his new friends reached the town square. There were over 100 entities and 200 children gathered together there. Some children were weeping, others stood silently, eyes ringed with dark circles from lack of sleep. Every single one of them looked utterly terrified. The entities began to chant together, I now arrive to the sea of sin, with the red of my flesh to offer him. A mirror-like rectangle appeared above the town square's fountain, spinning until it blurred into a black void. Then, Mr. Hister emerged from the darkness. Mr. Hister addressed the crowd, calling out, My children, it is time to tell Mr. Hister what lesson you learned today. He selected a young girl from the crowd and asked her to recite the lesson she learned. She answered, repeating a lesson from Mr. Squibbles concerning the importance of tying one's shoes. Mr. Hister replied, Your prize is to pass through the mirror and into the dreamlands. He lifted the girl into the air and tossed her into the mirror behind him. She screamed and disappeared. He proceeded to call up child after child, asking them to repeat the lesson that they learned. When they answered, they were tossed into the mirror. If the child couldn't remember their lesson, however, well, the less that is said about that, the better. Before long, the fountain was filled with deep red water, which the other Tiki Taffy Town entities greedily slurped up. Eventually, Mr. Hister turned to Dave, asking him what lesson he learned. Dave struggled to answer, guessing a phrase that Mr. Squibbles said, don't make Mrs. Bobble upset lest you fail his hideous test. This was the wrong answer. Mr. Hister lifted Dave into the sky, where he was suspended upside down alongside other humanoid figures, one of whom he recognized as his long-lost younger brother, Jeremy. At this point, Dave stopped responding to Dr. Monroe and his research team. The camera feed remained active for three days, suspended upside down next to Dave's body. On screen, a continuous stream of red liquid, presumed to be blood, could be seen flowing over the lens. The feed was cut short, and Dave was presumed lost. As harrowing as it was, this initial test provided the SCP Foundation with some vital information on the inner workings of SCP-5853-A. They were able to determine that, depending on the answer a stolen victim gives, they will be able to affect their own fate. If the victim answers Mr. Hister's question, what did you learn today, with the intended lesson imparted in the episode, they will be passed through the mirror. What awaits them beyond it, no one but Mr. Hister knows, but it is unlikely to be anything good. If the victim answers with a lesson they learned while inside of the extra-dimensional space, they will be left to hang upside down with Dave and the rest of those suspended in the air. If they don't remember or lie about forgetting their lesson, they will be consumed by the entities. But there is one way out. If the victim answers by repeating or summarizing Mr. Hister's darker lesson from the episode, the victim will be released from the extra-dimensional space and transported back to the place they vanished from. For example, UIU Agent Mathis' son, Thomas, reappeared in the kitchen pantry of his home on January 8, 2000, after he did just that. Following the D-Class exploration of Tiki Taffy Town, Dr. Monroe reached out to Jennifer Lamb, requesting that she reconsider her decision to decline MTF operations in the area. She refused to change her mind, telling him to scan media spaces, recall the candy, and call it a day. With the Ethics Committee refusing to approve MTF action, Dr. Monroe instead reached out to his friend, Terence Bazarian, who occupied an MTF Alpha position. He managed, via appealing to Terence's role as a parent, to convince him to agree to an off-books, three-man mission into the spatial anomaly of SCP-5853-A. The small, unofficial mobile task force began its operation on January 20, 2000. Frank Monroe served as commanding officer. Terence Bazarian acted as team lead, Alpha, Robert Falk as right flank, Charlie, and Mohammed Al-Abi as left flank, Delta. 
Each member of the team was instructed to consume a piece of cherry-flavored tiki taffy and recite the phrase, You may not believe in the slaughter, but the slaughter believes in you. Soon after, all three men were transported into the world of SCP-5853-A. They climbed out of the toy chest to find the cartoonish kitchen, the busily decorated living room, and the door to the outside area. The MTF team got to work investigating the area immediately, making note of the fact that all of the items in the house were fake, simply props for a children's show. The door to the set began to open, and the three MTF members hid out of sight. Monroe warned them to not, under any circumstances, engage with the entities in any way. The cast, with the exception of Mr. Hister, entered the room and began checking the area for signs of new children transported to the world. Alpha was discovered first and opened fire on Mr. Squibbles, who stumbled backward, leaking brown fluid until it collapsed. The remaining entities began to scream as the area dimmed to black. Suddenly, everything was dark and silent. The MTF feed switched to night vision as Delta, Charlie, and Alpha began to explore the area. Monroe ordered them to get to the town center as fast as possible and tell Mr. Hister the key phrase so that they could be transported back to the SCP Foundation site. As he delivered the instructions, his audio feed began to degrade until the MTF officers could no longer hear him. Left alone in Tiki Taffy Town, they had to proceed on their own. As the officers resumed motion, Franzi Pans flew at Charlie's head at top speed, its hammer beak colliding with the man's head and sending him careening into a nearby wall. The impact was fatal, and Agent Charlie collapsed to the ground, dead. Agents Alpha and Delta continued firing on Franzi Pans, and Alpha ordered Delta to head toward the door and make his way out. When he reached the door, however, Mr. Squibbles was waiting on the other side. It grabbed Agent Delta as an instance of Kizzywink used its claws to kill him. In a heroic dying act, Agent Delta pulled a pin from one of his incendiary grenades and charged at Mr. Squiggles, blowing them both up. Agent Alpha was the only one left standing, alone with Mrs. Bobble the Clown. She charged at Alpha as he fired a grenade round that subdued her. Taking his moment, Alpha escaped the building, navigating his way through the pitch black landscape. Alpha used his night vision view to navigate a narrow path toward a single light in the distance. He walked for approximately 182 minutes, at which point he remarked on the sensation of the path deepening, lengthening, and pulling him down. He began to approach the town square before everything faded to static. When Alpha's video feed returned, he was standing in front of a white wooden door. He reached out to open it and spotted a woman that appeared to be Jessie Bazarian, his wife, sitting in a rocking chair and humming a lullaby to the infant in her arms. He attempted to speak to her but she addressed him in the manner of Mr. Hister, saying, See the mirror, through the mirror. The mirror is the only salvation. Salvation achieved by sacrifice to he who is divine among the dreamlands. Release yourself through the mirror. Ascend through the mirror. Transcend through the mirror. Alpha screamed, collapsing to the ground. When he regained consciousness, he was face to face with Mr. Hister himself. The entity smugly asked, Terence, what did you learn today? Rather than reciting the key phrase and attempting to return home, Alpha pulled the pin from his remaining grenade and let it fall to the ground. The video feed cut out, and the entire mobile task force that entered Tiki Taffy Town that day was presumed dead. Two days later, Dr. Frank Monroe sent out the following email. To whom it may concern and see Miles. I regret to inform you that I am no longer able to fulfill my duties as researcher. I have come to the realization that Lamb was right, although I don't agree with her. I can't keep trying to save the world from the things we study. It's not about how far I can probe, it's for our own protection. I need to know when to call it quits. I could spend X number of dollars and X number of lives sacrificing to whatever to wherever I think, or wherever I think the mirror may bring us, who Mr. Hister might be, or the implications of a clown entity called Bobble. I could try to chase these down to their penultimate conclusion, sacrificing MTF, D-Class, and innocence alike. Lamb, she was right. God, I'm sorry, Terence. All SCP-5853 needs is to be hidden, in the dark. I'm sorry, I'm just not made for this. Not anymore. I can no longer do this. Let me forget. Let me go back. Consider this my resignation. Respectfully, Dr. Frank Monroe. After a review by the O5 Council, 
Dr. Monroe's resignation request was denied. All SCP-5853 products have been publicly recalled. Any instances of SCP-5853 are to be kept in a standard containment unit in Secure Facility 64, Wing F. If any instances of SCP-5853 are discovered being sold, the sale must be intercepted immediately. Every episode of SCP-5853-A has been removed from the air, and television broadcasts and online video sites must be scanned regularly in order to prevent further spread of the materials. No Foundation personnel, including D-Class, that have or are considered having children may be assigned to SCP-5853. The SCP Foundation has attempted to uncover the identities of production staff and actors from the show, but so far, the investigation has turned up nothing but dead leads. A close analysis of the show's credits showed that, rather than a list of staff that worked on the episode, they consist of a constantly growing list of names. These names include those of children reported missing, as well as individuals yet to be identified. On January 23, 2000, the names Robert Falk, Mohammed Al Abi, Terence Bazarian, and Frank Monroe were added. Frank Monroe was pronounced missing in action, and to this day, has never been found. The year is 1630, and the city of London is bustling with new life. The streets are filled with people going about their daily lives, cramming into housing and businesses, and struggling to accommodate the rapidly increasing population which has more than doubled in the previous 50 years. Among the new citizens of London is a dark figure who keeps to himself, a man in long black robes and a beaked mask, dressed like the plague doctors of the Black Death centuries before. The figure that will one day be known as SCP-049 has come to London town to embark on the next chapter of his life in his ongoing quest to solve the ills plaguing humanity. Though one might expect his appearance to make him stand out, most of the citizens surging through the city streets have far more important things on their minds than what the man in the mask might be up to. So he has managed to carve out a little sanctuary, an empty warehouse where he rests and works. When curiosity gets the better of him, he slinks down alleyways, avoiding crowds and listening for any whispered secrets he can catch from the shadows. It is on one of these outings that he hears tell of Henry Percy, also known as the Wizard Earl, a mysterious researcher of science and the occult held in Martin Tower in the Tower of London. A man of wisdom and curiosity, pushing the boundaries of scientific study. That is just the sort of man that the doctor has been hoping to meet and learn from here in this great city. The plague doctor swiftly abandons his sanctuary and makes his way to the Tower of London, where he makes swift work of the guards that would bar him from entry. He does not enjoy harming innocents, but alas, some sacrifices must be made in the pursuit of greater knowledge and understanding. Leaving a trail of bodies in his wake, the plague doctor makes his way into Martin Tower. Excuse me, sir. I apologize for the intrusion, but as a fellow academic, I wondered if I might speak with you. But as he enters the chamber, the doctor finds that his polite introduction was wasted on an empty room. Wherever this wizard earl might be, he is not in his designated quarters. Fearing the worst, the doctor searches for signs of a struggle, for bloodstains on the floor or overturned furniture, but everything appears to be in its rightful place. Where then could Henry Percy have gone? The plague doctor explores every inch of the tower, searching for any clues that might point him in the direction of the missing man. He inspects every item on every surface, pulls every book from every shelf, but as he pulls one particular book from its spot, the bookshelf appears to pop loose from the wall like a door opening. Indeed, it is a door, revealing a dark, winding stairway just beyond its secret opening. Ah, so this is where you have disappeared to. Truly this Earl must be a clever man, a good ally to have in the battle against the pestilence. He follows the stairs down, down, down into a small room in the bowels of the tower. It is a sparse, barren room, with only a stack of journals and a large iron door. The doctor spends hours searching for a lock or other mechanism to open the door, before turning to the journals left behind by the tower's occupant. There, he discovers the instructions for unlocking the Iron Gateway, directions he recognizes from his time studying alchemy. Fortunately, he has all of the necessary materials tucked away in his trusty doctor's bag, and he is able to effectively perform the esoteric procedure. As he dusts off his gloved hands, content with a job well done, he hears the click of a bolt unlatching, and the second secret door he has discovered today swings open to welcome him in. Ever the adventurous spirit, the doctor picks up his bag and crosses the threshold into whatever awaits him on the other side. 
As the iron door shuts behind him, the doctor gazes up into a yellow sky dotted with an infinite number of black stars. A breeze blows the scent of dried flowers, mold, and the dusty pages of century-old books into his nostrils. He hears the sound of waves lapping at a shore and turns to take in the sight of a thick black sea washing up onto a stark white shore. The world around him is an array of black, white, yellow, and red, the yellow sky reflecting in the inky waves, the glittering black stars dancing above garish red buildings, white staircases, yellow doors, and black windows made from something like stained glass. This strange new place is not empty either. All around him, there are as many people bustling through the streets as there are back in London, though their attire is quite different. These people dress in a way that feels familiar, that reminds the plague doctor of the ornate clothing he once saw at the Carnival of Venice. The people cover their faces too, Comedia dell'arte masks hiding their features and giving them a mysterious appearance. For the first time since the days of the Black Plague, the doctor is keenly aware of the fact that he does not stand out in this place. In fact, he blends right in. Now to search for Henry Percy, or anyone else who can offer the doctor some helpful insight. Uncertain of where exactly to start, the doctor decides to simply strike up a conversation with a stranger. A woman walks by in an elaborate red gown, her feathery white mask almost resembling a swan. Excuse me, madame, the doctor calls to her, stepping into her path. No time to talk, I'm already quite late. She brushes past him, and the doctor braces for the ill effect of physical contact between the two to take hold. However, she continues on her merry way, seemingly unaffected by his normally deadly touch. He watches her go, stunned into silence for a moment. The citizens of this strange new place, it is safe for him to touch them. Something else catches his eye about the woman too. Up close, it seemed to him that her mask was not a costume piece, but in fact, a part of her face, much like his mask was a part of his own. Oh, curious, he remarks aloud to himself. Henry Percy can wait. This is a far more compelling matter. I must uncover more about this land. And so the plague doctor takes a long stroll through the unusual city, noticing as he goes that the geometry and gravity of this place do not play by the rules he recognizes. Buildings slant at odd angles, alleyways and corridors appear and disappear, as the layout of the city seems to shift at random with each glance. The people themselves are just as bizarre as the place they occupy, behaving either uniquely rudely or entirely too familiar. Pushing past the doctor with a glare or tugging at his robes insistently, attempting to pull him down an alleyway or into a rapturous bout of sudden fevered dancing in a town square. He refuses these advances as politely as possible and carries on his way. An elegantly dressed couple gives him a friendly wave as they walk by him, not an unusual occurrence. What is unusual is where they are waving from, looking down on him from an upside down staircase that they traverse with no trouble some other gravity source holding them in this reversed position as they disappear into a dizzyingly constructed building. Fascinating. The doctor shakes his head in awe. Then it occurs to him. He should be taking notes on all of this. He opens his bag and digs around for his leather-bound notebook, but can't seem to find it. He stops on the street and begins dumping out the contents of his pack onto the stone walkway. Jars of specimens, salves, syringes, and surgical tools all tumble out, but no notebook. It must have fallen out of his bag somewhere on his journey. Or worse, it could have been stolen by one of these flamboyantly dressed strangers. No, no, he mustn't allow his mind to jump to the worst possible explanation. Most likely, he simply dropped it somewhere, and he only needs to retrace his steps to find it. He begins to walk back the way he came, as best he can find it in city streets that seem to warp and change with every moment like the landscape of a dream. He approaches dozens of people, but each stranger he speaks to brushes him aside, rushing off to their far more important business. They seem to look at him with disdain, like something foul stuck to the bottom of their fine shoes. It is discouraging, and it seems as if the notebook may very well be lost forever. But then, hope. Amidst a sea of people hurrying to their next destination, the doctor spots a man in a red cloak standing notably still, leaning against a nearby wall. The figure looks up at him, eyes shining behind a red mask in the shape of a happy, smiling face, reminiscent of the figure of Il Capitano from Commedia dell'arte performances the doctor dimly recalls. He sheepishly approaches the grand figure in the cloak and red mask, explaining that he is an outsider to this place. When the red masked man speaks, he speaks in a warm voice, but with a distinct air of authority. Welcome to Alagada, sir, for that is the name of this kingdom. You are fortunate, very fortunate indeed, for I am the Red Lord of Alagada, wearer of the Mirthful Mask, a chief advisor to the king. 
Being a man with medieval origins, the Plague Doctor bows deferentially the second he hears that he's in the presence of a lord. With his knees on the ancient cobblestones below, he begs the Red Lord for assistance in finding his precious notebook, the bearer of all his research and valuable scientific secret. The Red Lord pushes himself away from the wall, standing at an impressive height, seemingly suddenly far larger than he had at first glance. His face seems to strike a sympathetic tone, as sympathetic as one can be while wearing a mask. With a grandiose hand gesture and a dramatic stride, he asks the doctor to follow him and begins strutting off down the alleyway. The doctor has come across a person with good manners in this confounding place. He follows close behind the Red Lord as the two traverse the unstable landscape, following a yellow cobblestone street to a winding black staircase that curls around and around in a seemingly eternal spiral before tilting dizzyingly on its side. The doctor hesitates, afraid he will lose his footing, but much to his surprise, the laws of gravity seem to shift along with the angle of the stairs. It feels as if he is still walking along the same even plane as before, though he can see the sights below now jutting out of view at a disconcerting right angle that makes his vision swim and his stomach turn. So he turns his gaze onto his companion's back matching the Lord's every confident step. He wonders idly where the man is taking him, but decides to hold off on additional questions until they have reached their destination. The Red Lord comes to a stop at the top of a tall, thin tower. He stands before an unusually shiny black door that curls down at the edges, like the entryway itself is frowning. He sweeps his arm in the direction of the door and beckons the Plague Doctor to follow him inside. Before the Plague Doctor can even mention that the door has no handle or knocker, it simply opens of its own accord, as if by magic. He shakes his head. The Red Lord has already vanished inside, and he quickly follows him. The color palette of Alagada is already quite limited, but this room is stripped of the scant bits of bright pigment found outside. Not a scrap of red or yellow can be seen here, save for the suddenly garish garb of the Red Lord himself. The chamber is decorated in black and white, shimmering black velvet and cold, cruel white marble or something like marble, as this material has an eerie, icy sheen that almost hurts to look at. In a large black chair that again curls down at the edges in a melancholy fashion, there sits another masked man. He is clad in black robes, and his pale white face bears the face of tragedy, open mouth curved into a permanent frown of anguish. The Red Lord gestures to the figure in the chair, who does not speak, and introduces him as the mighty Black Lord of Alagada. The Plague Doctor can see the Black Lord's eyes following him from within the holes of the mask, a mask that members of the SCP Foundation would later refer to as SCP-035. The Doctor asks whether the Black Lord can help him find his book, puzzled at this whole situation. The Red Lord throws his head back and begins to laugh, a warm and genuine sound that nonetheless sends a shiver down the Doctor's spine. The Red Lord claps a hand on the Doctor's shoulder, giving it a squeeze that feels encouraging and threatening all at once, explaining that he'd been brought here under false pretenses. The Lord's already had the book. The Black Lord just needs a favor before he can have it back. Thank you for accepting my invitation, the Black Lord speaks, his voice hissing out from the scowling mouth of his mask. The Plague Doctor protests, demanding his book, furious at the deception. <laughs> oh, you'll get them back, the Red Lord laughs again. The Black Lord will return them if you prove yourself worthy of their ownership. I bid you farewell, Doctor. May your stay in Alagata be... pleasant. The Red Lord sweeps out of the room, leaving the Doctor alone with the Black Lord. Silence hangs heavy between the two. Before the Doctor asks the Black Lord why he'd even want a physician from another world to attend to him, the Black Lord wheezes and spits up black slime that corrodes the ground beneath him. The Doctor shakes his head. I am no miracle worker. Only a simple doctor. I struggle to treat the ailments of my own world. I do not wish to disappoint you, but I have failed again and again to cure the pestilence that plagues my home. I do not know if I would have the capacity to cure you. The Black Lord's frown seems to deepen. I am very sorry to hear that. Perhaps I should keep your notes for myself then, and give them to an Alagadan physician for research. The doctor's composure breaks. He stomps about the chamber, flinging open every door he can find, searching desperately for the work he'd spent his extremely long life painstakingly compiling, the work that represented his sole efforts in the medical field. He stops at a padlocked door on the far side of the room, grabbing hold of its lock. The Black Lord suddenly cries for him to stop, but it is too late. The Plague Doctor has wrenched the lock free from the door. As soon as the doctor lets the lock clatter to the ground, there is a horrid skittering sound, like the legs of a massive metal spider crawling along a wall. Click, click, click. 
And then, all at once, the formerly padlocked door is thrown open with such force it nearly rips from its hinges. A creature crawls through the opening, a monster with the body of a shiny yellow spider, a smooth white humanoid torso, two long clawed arms, and a round featureless orb of a face. It lashes out blindly, raking its claws at the Black Lord where he sits on his chair. Then, before the Plague Doctor can even try to apprehend it, the monster rips through the main door of the chamber, climbing out and over the edge of the tower and down to the city below. The Black Lord shouts for the Plague Doctor to help him. What about the monster? What will become of it? The Plague Doctor's mind races, trying to wrap around what he just witnessed. But the Black Lord has no interest in the monster. The city guards will take care of that. He needs help with his own injuries. The Lord groans in pain, a thick black substance leaking from his wounds and spreading across the once pristine white floor. The Black Lord implores the Plague Doctor to treat him. The Plague Doctor remembers his duty to all that suffer from illness and injury, an oath he once took a long, long time ago, and he opens his doctor's bag, ready to get to work. He has no grasp of Allegadon physiology, no idea where to begin in terms of performing any procedure on the Black Lord, but he cannot stand idly by and watch this man suffer. He begins pulling instruments from his bag, vials of phosphorescent elixirs and foul-smelling tinctures, and begins to improvise. He cleans the wounds with gauze dipped in one of his many tinctures, then begins treating them. The Black Lord's shallow breathing slows to deeper, calmer breaths as the medicine begins to do its job, and these positive results spur the doctor to work faster. He seals up each of the wounds, then slathers them all in a glowing green salve to prevent infection, if infection even exists in this world. When the work is finished, the Black Lord sits up, seemingly to be completely recovered except for the visible stitches and the tearing of his robes. Thank you, Doctor. I stole from you, and yet you helped me anyway. Allow me to return this to you, along with my sincerest gratitude. He reaches into the depths of his robes and produces the Doctor's leather-bound notebook. Take it. The Doctor snatches the notebook from the Black Lord's grip and returns it to its rightful place inside of his bag. Villa, he mutters to himself as he does. Our ways may seem strange to you, the Black Lord says, but these are troubled times in Alagada. All is not well in the court of the Hanged King. There is deception and betrayal everywhere. All kingdoms encounter periods of strife, the Plague Doctor remarks. If you will excuse me, now that I have treated you, I will be on my way back to my own land. I do not wish to stay here any longer. Of course. The Black Lord waves him toward the door. As the Doctor prepares to leave, however, the Black Lord speaks again. Are you quite sure that is your land, Doctor? You look quite like the child of a woman I once knew, long ago, who made the mistake of defying the King. She had the face of a crow, as you do. A mask that was not a mask. Excuse me? The Plague Doctor does not understand. Were you born in your world? Were you a child there? Do you remember it that way? The Black Lord asks. The Doctor thinks for a long moment. He cannot recall ever being anything other than what he is now, a Doctor with a singular purpose. I do not know. Perhaps, dear Doctor, this is not your first time in the land of Alagada, and I imagine that, with time, you shall walk its twisted alleys once again. Consider that on your journey back to the place you call home. The Black Lord laughs, a low, hollow sound. Farewell. Eager to be rid of this place with its lies, tricks, and monsters of many shapes, the Plague Doctor takes his leave. This journey he hoped would provide some answers, but instead, all he found were more questions than he ever could have anticipated. A knife in the dark, bloody teeth, and an appetite about to bring an end to one of history's most infamous monsters. The year is 1888, and the streets of London are teeming with tension and fear. In the daytime, people struggle to find work, fighting each other tooth and nail for scraps of opportunity. The sunlight only serves to illuminate the grime and misery, the workhouses and the factories, the smokestacks pumping poison into the sky. At night, though, it's even worse. The gas lamps provide only ghostly wisps of dim light, just enough to see a stranger's shadow from the corner of your eye, but not enough to see if the glint of something shiny in his hand is his pocket watch or his knife. You might glance over your shoulder for a closer look, but he's already disappeared into the fog if he was ever even there at all. These streets feel haunted even on the quietest of nights, but lately 
there are rumors swirling in the air of something far worse than a ghost skulking through the alleys. More real than the devil, more evil than any ordinary man, there's a killer on the prowl, and his name is Jack the Ripper. At first, most citizens refused to take notice of his presence, writing off his victims as women of ill repute, bound to meet a dreadful demise sooner or later. But as the bodies piled up, the sheer brutality of the killings became impossible to ignore. Now, everyone is on edge, particularly if their daily business takes them to London's east side, where the murders began. Once hoped to be a place of opportunity for those traveling to London from afar to seek their fortunes, Whitechapel has become a den of sin and terror. No one can breathe easy here, not until the Ripper is caught, if he ever is. There are theories, of course, accused noblemen, surgeons, butchers, and doctors. Whoever the culprit is, one thing is certain. He knows his way around a knife. Still, no one suspect seems to stick, and no one theory is compelling enough to lead to an arrest. Privately, behind locked doors where no policeman can hear them whispering, the people of Whitechapel are beginning to wonder whether the Ripper will ever be found. Perhaps this nightmare won't cease until the streets run red with blood. But even in the middle of hell on earth, day-to-day -day matters must still be attended to. So even as he worries for the lives of his customers and his own livelihood, the owner of a local pub posts a job listing, seeking a new cook. He doesn't need anything fancy, he can't pay for much, just a fellow who knows his way around a kitchen and can cook up decent enough food without accidentally slicing his fingers off. Still, he's not sure there's anyone out there who would be too happy to take a job so close to Jack the Ripper's domain at the moment. But the next day, as he comes in to unlock the doors and set up for the day, he finds an applicant waiting for him outside, grinning ear to ear. He's a massive fellow towering over the pub owner at a height he's never seen before outside of a circus performer on stilts. But he greets the pub owner with a firm handshake and follows him inside, though he has to hunch a great deal to fit through the door. It's not as if there's a line of applicants out the door, so the pub owner goes ahead and hires him as the new cook. The cook is a Frenchman, but he won't hold it against him. That night, when the pub opens for business, the new cook gets right to work. From his disposition, one would never know he's working for pennies in a dingy pub in the most dangerous part of town. He bustles around the modest kitchen, chopping meat and singing in a warm, loud voice that carries through the whole building, bringing some much-needed cheer to the exhausted customers. Pretty soon, they get a taste of the new cook's work, mutton and potatoes and juicy meat pies. Whoever this new worker is, the crowd is pleased to have him around. The owner does advise the cook to stay in the kitchen, though. His food and his singing may be popular but his appearance might frighten the already skittish regulars. There's plenty to be afraid of these days, no need to add a giant to the mix. When the pub closes up for the night, the owner stops for a moment to chat with his new cook. He can't help but be curious about the man, where he came from, what brought him to London. The cook tells him, tearfully, that he was once a soldier in the French army, but that he lost his military career following a tragic accident he refused to disclose the details of. After that, he worked in a circus, then as a private chef in the home of a wealthy French family, until he was thrown out over a forbidden love affair with his boss's daughter. The pub owner isn't sure he believes a word of it, but he nods along just the same. He asks the cook when he first arrived in London, the 1st of April, he says, and with that, he heads off home, leaving the pub owner alone with his thoughts, the color draining from his face. April 1st was only two days before the first Jack the Ripper victim was discovered. It couldn't be could it? As the pub owner embarked on his journey home, he replayed the image of the cook's work that night over and over in his mind. The man was plenty competent with a knife, that was certain. He was strong enough to kill quickly, too. With those hands, he could squeeze the life out of someone before they even got the chance to scream. He could have done it. But why would he? He seemed like such a friendly man, odd though he was. And he was odd, almost frightening. He had clearly lied about his past as well. What reason would he have for doing that, if not to conceal a dark and terrible secret? The pub owner lies awake all night, horrific visions of his new cook keeping him from sleep. The next day, the pub owner's suspicions begin to fester and grow. He notices things he didn't pick up on before, the strange way the cook always speaks through his teeth, the deft way that he handles a butcher knife, slicing through the cuts of meat that he brings to the pub himself. What butcher is he going to? Where's he finding so much meat in such scarce times? The owner shudders at the possibilities. His customers are starting to take notice of his change in attitude, too. They see the sweat dotting his brow, 
his furtive glances toward the kitchen and the way his hands shake when he brings them their plates of food. Several customers corner the owner and demand an explanation. These days, they can't let any unusual behavior go on for long. Something sinister could be afoot, after all. The pub owner relents and confesses his suspicions that his newly hired cook might be the Ripper himself. Not only that, but he's afraid the meat he's been preparing might not be sourced from any livestock, but from more of the Ripper's victims. It was an unwise choice to admit these fears to a group of men driven to the edge of reason by their own dread, bodies in the streets, and a bit too much ale. They swarm the kitchen to confront the cook and are shocked at the sight of the behemoth they find there. The cook greets them with his usual smile, but they aren't having any of it. They attack him in spite of his intimidating size, pummeling him with their fists. The cook tries to reason with the men, but they are determined to get an answer out of him, and his previously unfailing smile falters. He opens his mouth wide and in a truly shocking display, gobbles up one of the men in two quick bites. He spits out a shoe and it flies across the room, hitting another one of the men in the face. There is silence for a long moment, and then sheer pandemonium. The surviving men tear out of the pub, spilling into the streets in a drunken, panic-stricken mob. Wiping his mouth, the cook turns to see his boss, staring at him with wide eyes, frozen to the spot in fear. With a polite bow, the cook gives his resignation, apologizes for the disruption, and turns to see himself out. Meanwhile, the pub patrons are cornering a policeman, demanding he follows them to the location of a giant, man-eating monster who they believe to be the Ripper. The policeman laughs in their faces and advises them to head home and sleep off their drinks before they get themselves into any more trouble. With a full belly, but without a job, and without anywhere else to go, the cook ducks out the door to the pub and begins to stroll slowly down the dark, dingy streets. Up ahead, he sees a woman walking alone. She drops something on the ground, a small coin purse. She doesn't notice it fall, and keeps walking. But the cook is very much a gentleman, in spite of his cannibalistic indiscretion before. He hurries over and bends to pick it up. When he looks back at the woman, he sees a man creeping up behind her. The shadowy man draws a knife and lifts his arm, preparing to strike. The cook cries out to warn the woman, and she turns, letting out a blood-curdling scream at the sight of both the would-be killer and the giant with blood still dripping from his chin. She picks up her skirts and runs as fast as she can, disappearing down a nearby alley and out of sight. The cook still holds her coin purse in his massive hand, but there's no way she'll come back to retrieve it now. The man with the knife turns on the cook with a roar of primal rage. He slashes at the giant with his knife, but it merely glances off of the enormous man's tough skin, not drawing so much as a single drop of blood. He tries again and again, but fails to make even a mark. Frustrated, exhausted, and still a little bit hungry, the giant grabs hold of the attempted killer, lifts him into the air, opens his mouth wide, and swallows him whole in a single gulp. The knife, still stained with the blood of his previous victims, clatters to the ground. The cook sighs and tucks the coin purse into his pocket. Then he continues on his way, walking out of London and on to the next chapter of his life's grand adventure. He has no idea that his climactic meal in Whitechapel was none other than the infamous Jack the Ripper, and the people of London will never know of the unintentional act of heroism he committed that day. They will only remember the fear and the sight of a giant devouring a man alive. But soon enough, that will fade from memory, replaced with relief when no new victims are found, and then replaced again with a mystery that will endure for hundreds of years. Though that cook was no ripper, he was also, clearly, no ordinary man. Before they decided to drive him out of town, the people of Whitechapel had, unbeknownst to them, been eating and drinking with SCP-082. SCP-082 is, according to his genetic makeup, a perfectly ordinary human. However, one look at SCP-082 makes it clear that he is far from ordinary. Some sort of external process has caused him to grow to an enormous size, standing at 8 feet tall and weighing around 700 pounds. Foundation researchers are divided in opinion over the exact cause of SCP-082's unique proportions. Some theorize that it is some sort of mutation, others propose an extreme hormone imbalance, some believe it to be chemical in nature, while others insist that only a supernatural force could be responsible for such a dramatic deviation from the norm. Whatever the case may be, SCP-082 is a formidable and visually impressive specimen. His head is bald and slightly pointed, his chin and jaw are large and round. 
His nose is bulbous, and his eyes are dark and sunken. His body has a high fat content, but also contains notable muscle mass, and his physical strength should not be discounted. His forearms have a circumference of around 28 inches, and his fists are nearly an entire foot across the knuckles. Suffice it to say, he is not the sort of opponent you would want to come up against in a fight, and certainly not someone to antagonize, though medical examinations of his body indicate that at least a few likely ill-fated individuals have tried over the years. His skin is covered with scars, and though his x-rays are difficult to read due to the density of muscle tissue, scans have indicated that there are dozens of bullets and several blades, from knives and swords alike, buried in the man's flesh. Clearly, SCP-082 has been through a great deal of hardship. But you wouldn't know it from his disposition. He is gregarious and polite, with a personality as big as the rest of him. Oh, that reminds me, I've been extremely rude. He has a name. It's Fernand. At least, that's what he says. Fernand speaks fluent French, but is proficient in English as well, though he speaks with a heavy accent. Whenever he does speak, he does so with a smile, talking through his tightly clenched and massive teeth. Occasionally, he clenches these teeth so hard that his gums will begin bleeding from the effort. The reason for this is unknown, but the SCP Foundation considers it normal behavior for Fernand, whatever that means. I have my own personal theory regarding Fernand's penchant for clenching his teeth, but I won't get into that just yet. Fernand does occasionally open his mouth all the way and separate his teeth, but only when he is eating or singing. He is quite the musical talent, serenading the SCP Foundation with his takes on well-known classical music, as well as long-forgotten drinking songs and the occasional sea shanty. He loves to sing while cooking, which he is permitted to do under strict Foundation supervision. He is allowed access to a rudimentary set of cooking implements whenever he prepares his food, including a butcher knife that he also uses to shave his unusually thick facial hair. He is given various ingredients to prepare on request, with the stipulation that these ingredients must not be too expensive or human in origin. In spite of his off-putting appearance and tendency to speak through his teeth, Fernand is easily one of the more likable anomalies contained by the Foundation. He doesn't express overt hostility like SCP-682, nor does he attempt to diagnose staff with any sort of pestilence like SCP-049. All he seemingly wants to do is cook, sing, and play dress-up. Did I mention his costume trunk yet? Well, he has one. Some of his favorite outfits include a tuxedo, complete with top hat and a monocle, a military uniform serves of the French Revolution, a ball gown that comes with an elegant fan and matching beaded purse, and a clown costume that includes a wig and a trick water-squirting flower in its pocket. New costume pieces are made on request in order to keep Fernand's morale high. According to my findings, in-house costumers are currently hard at work making Fernand a detective costume, a chef's hat, and a set of footy pajamas. Fernand is an indisputable charmer, greeting Foundation researchers with a wide smile, a joke, and more often than not, an invitation to join him for dinner. Unfortunately, those same staff members occasionally find themselves on the menu. In spite of all his endearing qualities, Fernand has the unfortunate habit of routinely snapping, giving in to his voracious appetite, and eating his visitors alive. He doesn't intend to do so, and frequently expresses regret at his poor manners. After all, Having company for dinner doesn't mean you eat your company, but still he can't help himself, no matter how recent his latest meal was. Though I have yet to confirm this hypothesis, I believe this cannibalistic impulse to devour others may be the reason for Fernand's constant clenching of his teeth. Whether consciously or not, I think he is attempting to hold off on attacking for as long as he can, before he inevitably succumbs to the hunger once more. When his gums bleed, it could be a sign that one of his attacks is drawing near. Again, I have yet to confirm this, but it seems entirely possible. It's unlikely that Fernand will ever be able to verify this for himself, as his connection to the truth is tenuous at best. Though he is highly intelligent in terms of his memory, puzzle-solving skills, and grasp of language, Fernand struggles to differentiate between fact and fiction when consuming media. He assumes that any movie or television show he watches is depicting a real person, and that any book he reads is essentially a biography. This doesn't limit his enjoyment of this media. On the contrary, he gets a great deal of joy from watching films and reading books, particularly works of fiction revolving around Hannibal Lecter, who Fernand has described as his favorite person and someone he would very much like to meet one day. To make matters even more interesting, Fernand does understand the concept of lying. He's able to identify when someone is lying directly to him and also displays signs of being a compulsive liar himself, particularly when it comes to his personal history. 
Over the course of his containment, he is claimed to be a vampire, a homunculus, beloved Sesame Street character Big Bird, also beloved actor and wrestler Andre the Giant, Napoleon Bonaparte, French comic book character Obelix, the Foundation's own Dr. Bright, the Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, and Detective Sherlock Holmes. He has also claimed, at different times and once on the same day, to be both Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. When called out directly on these lies, Fernand offers only this explanation. But I only lie when it's through my teeth. Which I have to admit, is pretty funny. SCP-082, Fernand, is currently contained in enlarged living quarters in Armed Biocontainment Area 14. As he is unfazed by most standard weaponry, his cooperation has been ensured through deception rather than physical force. Fernand has been led to believe that he is acting King of France, placed in a secret palace for his own protection from potential assassins. Any personnel that interacts with Fernand must address him as if he were, in fact, the King of France, and any deviation from the charade is met with swift discipline. Any housekeeping done in 082's containment area must be performed by Class D personnel only, as it poses too much of a risk to non-disposable staff. Guards assigned to SCP-082's containment will receive Level 2 clearance but are not permitted to interact directly with SCP-082, no matter how friendly he is, no matter how many knock-knock jokes he tells them, and no matter how he tries to entice them into a round of karaoke. SCP-082 is a curious mix of congenial and threatening, the consummate host who loves to sing and cook for anyone willing to sit at his table. He's also strong enough to snap a spine in half, and has teeth that can crack open skulls, a skill that he demonstrates with stomach-churning regularity. Still, he seems to genuinely enjoy the company of others and has an earnest, playful spirit. From his giving spirit to his diet, SCP-082 really gives a new meaning to the word humanitarian. If you ever have the chance to meet him, just be careful not to let your guard all the way down, because there's a fine, fine line between being his dinner guest and being his dinner. The trucker tumbles to the greasy floor of the diner, thrown out of his booth, only to come crashing down before he can regain his footing. He'd be climbing back to his feet, ready to square up to the patron who has just hurled him, but staring up at them has made him freeze on the spot. As he lies on the diner floor, the trucker's eyes lock onto the bizarre horror towering over him. It looks like a huge fleshy mess, more akin to a chewed up wad of gum than a living being. It's nearly impossible to differentiate what parts of its head are facial features. Is the mouth right there in the center, or is it one of the various other strange and inexplicable orifices? Does it even have a mouth? And where are its eyes? Does it have the standard human too, or does it see by smelling sounds or tasting the air? And are those tusks? They are. The trucker has only stopped off for a hot cup of coffee and a bite to eat. Now he's facing off against a puzzling creature ripped straight out of a David Cronenberg movie. But then again, that's what he gets for stopping off at Freddy's Diner. It all begins a few moments prior. The trucker is at the wheel, exhausted but making good time on a long haul across the interstate. Thanks to life on the road, he's been lucky enough to see much more of the country than most driving from the west coast to the east coast and back again plenty of times. And being so familiar with his roots, the trucker has his very own curated list of the best places to eat while on the road. He double checks the time and realizes he's got plenty to spare, so decides to make a quick detour and heads towards a little known roadside restaurant, Freddy's Diner. The trucker still remembers the previous time he took a pit stop in Freddy's place. It never ceases to amaze him that it even exists. After all, there's not another diner like it from here in California to the truck stops over in New Jersey. And the trucker knows he'd pick Freddy's Diner over any maritime-themed novelty seafood place. He likes going there so much, he's even kept it a secret from his fellow truckers on the road. He'd simply hate for everyone to start piling over there and turning his favorite spot into a rowdy trucker hangout or tourist attraction. Pulling his truck up outside, the trucker locks the vehicle up securely and heads inside. From outside, it's just a calm, quiet-seeming place, a diner like any other in that stereotypical 1950s style. That's part of what the trucker likes so much about Freddy's. It's got that comforting, nostalgic feeling to it, like one of the few remaining vestiges of an era that nearly nobody alive remembers anymore, except from seeing it secondhand in old movies. But despite it looking quiet, practically empty from the outside, stepping through the doors at Freddy's is like setting foot on another planet. The entrance isn't just the way into the restaurant, it's the access point to the trucker's other favorite part about visiting there. The people. 
At first, it seems normal. There's always a decent number of customers bustling about, talking to each other or ordering from Freddy, the friendly silver-haired old owner dressed in his typical pinstriped apron over a shirt and bow tie. No matter if he's in the middle of serving a customer, Freddy always turns to greet the newest arrival with a warm smile and his classic motto, Welcome to Freddy's Diner, the only place where you can eat cuisine that's out of your world. The trucker loves how gradually it creeps up on him. Taking a cursory glance around the diner, nothing seems all that out of the ordinary. But looking closer, he enjoys noticing the other patrons and how eccentric they all seem. When taking a gamble on Freddy's and making his first ever visit on another long drive to California, the trucker finds himself convinced that there must be some kind of science fiction or comic book convention in town. Then soon after, he starts to get a little worried thinking that maybe he's been on the road too long and is starting to see hallucinations out of pure exhaustion. But now he's been in enough times to know the folks who pitch up to eat at Freddy's Diner. Well, the best way to put it is that they're from out of town. Wandering past the bar, looking for somewhere to sit down, the trucker notices a trio of figures sitting down and enjoying plates full of freshly grilled burgers and baskets of golden fries hot from the fryer. What does it matter that all three are wearing huge, bulky spacesuits with metal piping snaking down them and vents hissing out warm steam? They're just enjoying their meals, after all. The trucker finds a vacant booth and sits down on the comfortable leather seat, scanning the diner for Freddy so he can order a coffee. Sitting across from him at the opposite booth, his eyes fall across a couple, smiling and giggling to each other as they chat. He's so caught up in their infectious, positive vibes that he barely realizes how one of them has had her entire right arm replaced with an intricate cybernetic one, or that the other is entirely blue and has pointed ears. It's just nice seeing how happy they are. That's when a voice that sounds like someone gargling water chimes up, and a sinewy tentacle grabs the trucker by his flannel shirt. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? The patron gurgles. I got up to use the bathroom for five minutes and find some chump in my seat. That's my table, pipsqueak. Moments later, the trucker is on the floor, looking up at a creature he's never seen before. In fact, he's not even sure if the patron is human. Judging by the chewing gum head and the disproportionate limbs protruding from random points across its blobby body, it's a safe bet that it isn't. The trucker stumbles towards the bar and asks Freddy for a cup of coffee, a strong one, to wake him up in case he's dreaming. Across his visits to the diner, he's been convinced that all the flamboyant and eccentrically dressed customers are all just wearing costumes, either for a local convention or because of an anything-goes dress code. But after seeing the patron, the trucker's starting to think that he might have been very, very wrong about this place. Not to be confused with a certain pizzeria populated with quirky animatronic characters, Freddy's Diner is a restaurant experience like no other. But if you're hoping to experience its comfort food and unique atmosphere for yourself, then you might have a hard time getting past the quarantine zone that now surrounds the diner, thanks to the SCP Foundation. Technically, Freddy's Diner is still very much in business, although you're not likely to see anyone stepping through or out of the front doors anytime soon. Well, not from this dimension, at least. Before it would go on to be known as SCP-4258, the SCP Foundation learns of this seemingly innocuous restaurant two months after it first appears. To begin, none of the people that live in the nearby area pay the place much mind. As far as they know, Freddy's Diner is just a harmless, 50s-themed diner. Each and every one of them remains totally unaware that their memories have been tampered with, so that as far as they're concerned, SCP-4258 feels like it's always been a local staple, despite only having been around for a few short months. However, some new folks roll into town, and pretty soon the Foundation are getting rather suspicious about Freddy's Diner, thanks to abundant reports of a strange restaurant with weird cosplayers from the newcomers. They send in an undercover agent to investigate, making sure to be as subtle as possible. After all, at this point, there's still every possibility that Freddy's Diner really is just a hotspot for cosplayers and other eccentrically dressed individuals. But if only things were that simple. Inside, the agent is greeted by familiar, nostalgic surroundings. Circular seated bar stools, black and white tiled floors like a chessboard underfoot, a jukebox in one corner blaring out hits from the likes of Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley. Even the menu has all the old classics on there. Thick, frothy milkshakes served in tall glasses, freshly made burgers and fries, the kind of food that fits the atmosphere of the 1950s. The thing that doesn't, of course, 
is the various, unusual customers that frequently eat at Freddy's Diner. Even without his extensive training in identifying anomalies, it doesn't take the Foundation's agent very long to realize that some of the people enjoying their meals inside SCP-4258 aren't all human. Some are. In fact, most of them do still resemble something close to humanoid. Although, upon closer inspection, it would appear that almost everyone in the diner has widely different physiology. Even those that look mostly human on the outside aren't a perfect match, at least by our standards. That's because everyone who visits Freddy's Diner has come from a completely different reality. SCP-4258 isn't your average diner. It's an interdimensional diner. People from all across the multiverse have made their way to this specific restaurant for a bite, and it's definitely popular with those that visit. Freddy's Diner might be the only restaurant that can claim to be multiversally loved, frequented by customers from multiple different dimensions all at once. Some days, you might see little more to indicate this than a few patrons wearing weird clothing, the kind that you've never seen before. A site like that is easy to write off as a bizarre fashion statement after all. But on other days, when you find yourself enjoying a classically made milkshake at the bar when a six and a half foot anthropomorphic slime creature sits down on the stool next to you, then it becomes a bit more apparent that Freddy's Diner is anything but ordinary. And the agent sent to investigate the place by the Foundation quickly gets that very same impression during his first visit. Perhaps in an effort not to get swept up in the wondrous Moss Eisley Cantina energy of SCP-4258, the agent approaches the bar and begins to conduct an impromptu interview in the field. He talks directly with an old gentleman who appears to be running the place, the sole worker and owner of the establishment, the man the diner is named after, Freddy. Although he'll later become known as SCP-4258-1, Freddy greets the agent with the same charming, well-mannered demeanor as all his customers, before the agent starts trying to get to the bottom of what exactly the place is. It's a diner, Freddy tells him after a quick chuckle. They don't have these in your dimension, kid. The agent clarifies that there are indeed similar diners elsewhere in this dimension, although they aren't quite like Freddy's. The owner reassured the agent that he's only kidding, and then delivers the diner's motto, which apparently took him a century to come up with. Welcome to Freddy's Diner, the only place where you can eat cuisine that's out of your world. Being well versed in the anomalous and aware of the existence of other universes, it doesn't take the agent very long to figure out that this diner acts as some form of multiversal junction point, a nexus where various different worlds can intersect. But Freddy points out that's not exactly entirely correct, but the agent has at least grasped some of the core principle. More than happy to converse with his new customer, Freddy explains that his diner exists in what is known as Todash space. This, according to him, is the space between dimensions, and the door to SCP-4258 does indeed connect to all sorts of drastically different realities. As the agent takes a look through the diner windows, he notices a change in the scenery. Where there was once the familiar setting of Earth, there is now a wide, sprawling desert that seems to stretch endlessly into the horizon and beyond. Just then, a tall humanoid figure wearing a mask steps into Freddy's diner, wrapped in extravagant robes. Freddy greets the newcomer as Quarelf. He's clearly a regular customer. The agent returns to questioning the old man, curious as to how the diner actually functions, and hoping to gain as much intelligence on the matter as possible for the SCP Foundation. One of the main questions the agent wants answered is, if Freddy's diner exists between dimensions, how can the customers possibly pay for their meals? After all, even on Earth, there are multiple forms of currency with different competing values. Across an infinite number of entire universes, there's hardly going to be one multiversally accepted form of payment. But luckily, Freddy has an answer, even if it is a little abstract. As he explains it, the restaurant is funded, in a sense, by something called Empathius. You know that happy feeling you get when you remember something nice or someone compliments you? The restaurant feeds off that, so it keeps the place running. Confused as to what he means, the agent asks for clarity. For a moment, it sounds like Freddy's Diner extracts positive emotions from its clientele, like a leech draining blood. But Freddy assures him that it's not quite the same. The diner itself only takes away the excess empathias, the positive emotions, that its customers experience from being there, enjoying their meals and the atmosphere of the interdimensional diner. Freddy likens it to trimming the edges of a hedge. SCP-4258 doesn't rob people of their enjoyment, it just takes a little bit to keep the lights on. The patrons that visit only have to feel happiness, and that's the only payment for their meal that Freddy wants. That brings the agent to a final question. 
If the restaurant takes a little bit of Empathias as payment, then what exactly is Freddy? The owner chuckles and says that he's just an old man looking to make good food. Speaking of which, he offers to take the agent's order. Not wanting to be rude, the agent asks for a hamburger and fries to go. He tries to see if there are any other staff working in the kitchen, but there doesn't look to be anyone at all, save for a pair of transparent hands that place a plate down on the kitchen line. Foundation researchers conduct a few different tests on the food that the agent received from SCP-4258, but their analysis quickly reveals that there's nothing harmful about it at all. It's just a well-made burger. The agent is subsequently sent back to the diner to gather more information about it. This time, he's given instructions from the Foundation to change up his approach and speak with some of the customers instead, to see what they think of Freddy's Diner. After all, despite his friendly demeanor, the old man could always be a liar, trying to cover up a more sinister nature to his restaurant, so he can lure in more unsuspecting people from across the multiverse. Although the agent has little reason to suspect anything untoward about SCP-4258, the Foundation is nothing if not thorough. During his second visit, the agent sits down with one of the customers enjoying a meal at Freddy's Diner, a humanoid being whose body is composed entirely of different types of stone. Just from a cursory glance, there looks to be a mixture of basalt, granite, and limestone all over the entity, who introduces itself as… Rock. The agent starts by remarking that the creature has a very interesting name. Everyone on Rock's world is named Rock. Pushing for more information on the creature's universe, the agent decides to ask if Rock's homeworld has a name, to which the reply is… Rock. As far as the agent can attain from Rock's fairly blunt description, the stone entity originates from a universe that lacks any life forms with flesh and blood bodies, or squishies, as Rock refers to them. It also states, with a similar lack of descriptive detail, that its home universe also lacks anything resembling vegetation. There are no trees or plants, which means that the denizens of this dimension only eat… Rock. Very delicious, yes. The agent submits a proposal to the Foundation for a third visit to Freddy's Diner, writing in his report that his latest interview has proven to be completely useless. Although it does at least provide one interesting detail about SCP-4258, besides all the facts about rocks. It seems that everyone within Freddy's Diner, regardless of which dimension they originate from, is capable of understanding each other. It's almost like a multiversal translator is in effect within the restaurant itself to make it easier for Freddy and his patrons to communicate. Returning to SCP-4258 for a third time, the agent finds himself striking up a conversation with a rather familiar face. His own. Against the improbable odds of infinite different people across an infinite number of universes in an endless multiverse, the Foundation agent happens to bump into one of his own counterparts from an alternate reality. And for the most part, this alternate agent seems to be from a universe that is practically identical to the first agents. The two men sit down and begin to have a friendly discussion almost immediately after entering Freddy's Diner. After all, it's likely that nobody else in the establishment is as familiar with each other as the pair of them are. The first agent is quick to remark at how strange this encounter is, even amongst his own years of experience at the SCP Foundation. Working with anomalies on a day-to-day -day basis is strange enough, but interviewing an alternate version of yourself has to be a jarring experience to say the least. The agent tries to establish any major differences between their two universes, asking his counterpart who he works for in his reality. The alternate agent explains that he also works for the SCP Foundation, or another version of it. So far, no differences. Next, the agent asks a more personal question. Is the alternate agent married? It turns out he is, as a matter of fact, they both are, and their wives are not only alternates of each other, but both versions of the couple have been together for 20 years. Next, the agent asks his interdimensional doppelganger to describe his world in more detail. More than happy to oblige, the alternate agent describes that, in his universe, it is currently the 21st century. Most of the socio-economic issues faced in this dimension are the same as this one. Political corruption is rife, there are shortages of essentials like food and water in many countries, along with various other problems. But, the alternate remarks, there are good things there too, like Shark Week. That sounds fairly close to our world, the agent observes. Seems like there aren't any noticeable differences between the two. Guess not. Pretty funny, huh? His alternate reality counterpart replies. It is at this point during the interview that Freddy comes over to give the alternate agent his order. A burger and fries, presented in delicious fashion on a plate. Awesome, thanks Fred, the alternate agent says, before turning to his food. Time to chow down. Then, the alternate agent's jaw proceeds to unhinge, revealing multiple rows of razor-sharp teeth hidden behind the front-facing human set. He lifts up the plate and begins to violently consume the burger and fries he ordered. 
Having devoured the meal in a matter of minutes, the alternate agent then eats the plate his food was set out on, crunching down chunks of ceramic. Returning to the Foundation, the first agent later requests to be administered with amnestics. His request is denied. Quiet, quiet. Duck down, out of sight over there. Are you recording? Why aren't you recording? The camera woman has no desire to shoulder her camera yet again. It has been like this all day. The three of them will walk ten feet, then all of a sudden, the presenter will dive behind a bush and beckon for herself and their guard to do the same. Her patience for it is certainly starting to wear thin. Clearly nowhere near as thin as their security guards, however, as the man flexes his trigger finger against the side of the rifle, grumbling to himself in Swahili. The camera woman should never have taken this job. She knows that now, but they are far too deep in the Tanzanian wilderness to turn back now. They parked their jeep up in the early hours of the morning and started walking at sunrise. The faint blue tinge to the dark forest around them tells her it must be almost sunrise again. The presenter turns to her and runs a hand through his carefully sculpted hair. His pink skin has been burning and peeling in the sun all day long. He looks like he'd give the flamingos from earlier a run for their money as she switches the LED ring light on. The presenter clears his throat and wipes the sweat from his brow. Rumor has it that the area we are entering into now is patrolled by highly sophisticated militarized drones. Myself and my crew are risking our lives here, but that's just what it takes when you decide to live as an extreme vegan. He insists on recording several more takes. By the fifth attempt, the camera woman stops hitting record, not worth filling up the memory with this waste of a shot. Extreme vegan. What will they come up with next? She had moved to Tanzania with dreams of working on documentaries with a capital D. Rich, beautiful shots of the world's most endangered animals basking by a watering hole or hunting to feed their starving cubs. Real footage, not this reality show nonsense. The presenter had touched down the previous day, immediately started asking about where the nearest fast food chain was, then threw a tantrum because the Wi-Fi in the hotel lobby was too slow. Bad as he was, he at least seemed mostly harmless. But their security guard… The camera woman glances over to him. The man seems more like a local thug with a gun than a trained professional. The studio must have been trying to save money hiring him. Goodness knows they were cutting costs hiring her to do video and audio. She should have smelled a rat and just said no. A light. It sweeps through the trees so quickly it almost catches the three of them. The camera woman hits the dirt just in time. The camera bumps awkwardly into her shoulder so hard she almost cries out. A mechanical whirring fills the night. The light sweeps this way and that as they all lie motionless on the ground. Then, just as abruptly as it appeared, the light swings away and the sound fades. Maybe those drones aren't as made up as they sounded. The presenter is clearly very shaken. His wide eyes dart around between the trees as they all get back to their feet. So much for being an extreme vegan. The camera woman glances over at their security guard. A twisted grin lights up his face. She notices a little pendant has slipped out of his shirt. A small white shard hanging from a handmade chain. Even in the dead of night, the camera woman has filmed enough elephants to recognize ivory when she sees it. The security guard, no, poacher, meets her gaze. His smile widens. He speaks Swahili in a low voice. We keep moving. Shouldering the rifle, the poacher marches onwards in the direction the drone had just been a few moments ago. The camera woman and presenter have no option but to follow. For a long time, the group walks in silence. It is the longest the presenter has gone without opening his mouth since his plane touched down. The camera woman would be enjoying the peace and quiet if it hadn't been for the sickening unease that had settled over them. Had that drone been real? If it had, and what exactly were they walking into right now? Some kind of secret facility? GMO research? Labor camps? But it just looks like any other patch of forest in Tanzania. Only… it doesn't. Come to think of it, as they walk, the camera woman starts to notice little differences. At first, they're too subtle to put a finger on, just a different feel to the air or a strange sound. Is it the plants, perhaps? She's no botanist, so doesn't really know what she's looking at. But she spent enough time out in the wild here to know a few plants. But now, she's spotting all kinds of strange new ones. A bush with huge red leaves here, a tree with long purple fruit there. She asks the presenter what they are. He looks up at the purple fruit tree, perplexed. Wasn't this supposed to be the whole point of this documentary? Exploring the furthest reaches of the world, looking for vegan alternatives? No idea, but let's roll the camera anyway. Ready? 
The presenter plucks a fruit and presents it to the lens, immediately spouting off about the fruit's medicinal qualities, levels of fiber, natural sugars, and low water consumption. All lies. The camerawoman scowls at him. The presenter turns the fruit over and screams, throwing it as far as his skinny arms will allow. Never one to waste a shot, the camerawoman follows the fruit on instinct, zooming in on it as it lands at the foot of a tree. Out from under the purple skin crawls an earwig. It's huge, just over three inches long at a guess. That's strange. If she didn't know any better, she'd think that was… A voice startles the three of them. It booms out from behind them, just up the slope. The presenter swivels so fast he falls over. The camera woman points the camera up the hill and snaps the figure into focus. The poacher pulls back the bolt on his rifle, finger already on the trigger. In the dark, they can hardly make out what they are looking at. It must be a man. It spoke in a man's voice, but it towers over all of them. It must be nearly seven feet tall. They can't discern any kind of human silhouette. Odd shapes jut out this way and that. What is it made from? The voice calls out again, a deep, rumbling voice, like an earthquake heard from the ocean floor or echoing through a forest. There were other sounds layered into its voice, high twittering sounds and guttural growls. The camerawoman looks to her companions. Clearly neither of them understand what it's saying either. Not Swahili, not English, not French or Arabic. The intent of the voice is very clear, however. They are not welcome. For the first time ever, the presenter is lost for words. The poacher shifts the butt of the rifle against his shoulder. Great. Now this is her job. The camera woman lowers her camera rig to the ground and raises both hands, approaching the figure carefully. The sun breaks over the horizon further up the slope. In just a few moments, she'll be able to see the stranger, whatever it is. Speaking Swahili, she explains that they are a film crew, here to shoot a documentary. They do not intend any harm and will make as little disturbance to the environment as possible. The creature does not seem to understand and repeats its previous command. It definitely sounded like a command, at least. The camera woman turns helplessly to her companions, just in time to see a small shadow rushing them. It runs on all fours, covering the ground impossibly fast. Ignoring the poacher and presenter, it snatches up her camera from the ground and hurls it at a tree. It crunches into the wood and falls to the ground in pieces. Sunlight breaks over the horizon, flooding the valley with light. The camera woman whirls around and glimpses the figure up the hill. It is a man, isn't it? Towering at nearly seven feet, the man is adorned with flowers, blossoms, and fungi. Animal skulls and pelts hang from his shoulders. Colorful face paint etches patterns, ancient and proud, deep into his features. African buffalo horns grow proudly from his head, accentuating a triumphant floral headpiece. But a glimpse is all she gets. The figure vanishes. A sweet-scented breeze rushes down to meet her from where he was standing just a moment ago. Where'd he go? The presenter cries. The camera woman can see something dangerous has lit up the man's face. He's found his story. She just doesn't know quite what it is yet. The poacher also has a wry smile on his face. He's looking at the discarded purple fruit from before. No, wait. He's looking at the earwig still crawling around it. She follows his gaze, and it confirms her suspicions from before. That's a St. Helena earwig, sure as the daylight streaming onto its scuttling legs. Declared extinct in 1967. The presenter is already marching off, further down the valley. The poacher shoulders his rifle and follows, not even glancing at the camera woman. She goes over to her broken camera and kneels down. No hope. She takes out the SD card from it and pockets it. What had that creature been that had thrown it at the tree? A monkey of some kind? The presenter calls out to her. Forget the camera, I've got a hidden one in my pocket. It'll look more authentic anyway. As they walk, they see more and more wildlife. In the early dawn, various animals are rising to their feet, stretching and wandering through the trees. At first, just small creatures, geckos, tortoises, insects. But soon they see gazelle, a family of oryx, even a hippo from a distance. But there is one thing each animal has in common. They were all declared extinct years ago sometimes centuries ago. The camera woman keeps her mouth shut. The last thing she wants is for the poacher to know that. Although judging from the spring in his step, he's already well on his way to figuring it out. All of a sudden, the forest opens out. A watering hole the size of a lake fills their view. Animals of all sorts fly, swim, bathe, drink, and play in the morning air. Parakeets dance overhead, rhinos lounge in the shallows. A dodo marches squarely past them on its way to join its friends. This has to be some kind of dream, surely. The penny finally drops for the presenter. 
He turns to his companions, wide-eyed, ready to say something, when he freezes. Staring at something behind them, a shadow falls over them all. The camerawoman turns to see an elephant, white as the morning snow, with round, pink eyes, old and wrinkled as time itself. It is hulkingly big, impossibly big. It dwarfs any bull elephant she's ever shot by several tons. The giant walks slowly, one plodding step at a time, right past them. So close she can almost reach out and touch it. Every part of her wants to. Only she knows better. You don't interfere with nature. The elephant passes them and disappears into the woods. She looks excitedly at her companions. The poacher has a glint in his eye. The presenter is hurrying off along the water's edge. Her eyes follow his movement. There, on the shore, kneels the towering man from before. He's beside a panting and straining ibex. She's on her side, belly swollen, blood mixing with the lake's water. The camerawoman draws closer, watching the man stroke the animal's side gently. He cups a painted hand behind the animal's rump and delivers a baby effortlessly. Another slides out a moment later. He takes the tiny ibexes under each arm and walks them into the water, delicately washing them clean before returning them to their mother by the shore. The presenter calls out to him, raising a hand in greeting. Sir, sir, would you be interested in conducting a brief interview with me? It's for a network television documentary called Extreme Vegan. The figure stands and turns to them, wary. The two of them stand before him, separated by just a few feet, extinct animals chattering and cheeping all around them. In order to maintain such an eco-friendly lifestyle, you must be having a lot of plant-based alternatives in your diet. Oat milk, corn, avocado, what's your secret? As if on cue, a buffalo emerges from the water and approaches them. The man stoops, not taking an eye off the presenter, and reaches under the buffalo's body. Finding the teeth, he squeezes milk into his cupped hand. He raises his hand to his mouth and drinks slowly, staring the presenter down. After a moment, he squeezes more milk into his hand and stretches it out towards them. He says a word in that same ancient voice, only this time, it is softer, welcoming. Uh-uh, no way. Do you know how unethical it is to deprive that poor child of its natural milk? The presenter goes off on a rant. The man ignores him and offers the hand to the camerawoman instead. Without thinking, she steps forward and stoops to his hand. She drinks the milk straight from his palm. It's warm and fatty, thick like cream, but totally delicious. She looks into the man's eyes. They are a dark brown, but in the morning light, she catches flecks of gold, green, purple, and blue. The man's voice is even softer as he speaks again. Alanue. His name. That must be the man's name. She raises a hand to her chest, opening her mouth to introduce herself. Bang! The shot rips through the clearing. Animals screech and scatter, stampeding into the trees. Birds fill the sky, alighting from every tree, so much so that they tangle with one another. Camerawoman's head whips around. The shot had come from the trees behind them. A roar, louder and more chilling than any animal could produce, swells from Alaniwe. This time, he doesn't just vanish. It's like he's raptured. Vines and roots shoot up out of the dirt, wrapping around him, creeping into his mouth and eye sockets. They wrench him into the ground with such force, it sends ripples across the lake. A rumbling fills the earth. The presenter cowers by the water's edge. He's useless. The camerawoman takes off into the trees, following the sound of the shot. It doesn't take her long to find it. The white elephant lies on its side, rivers of red cascading across its chest, following the ancient furrows of its wrinkled skin. Its breathing stutters and rattles. The poacher stands before the dying animal. He turns to the camerawoman, an unhinged grin lighting up his face. He opens his mouth to speak, but from out of his throat bursts a stem, blood spraying high into the air. The camerawoman watches in abject horror as the plant grows up through the poacher. Roots ensnare his feet and ankles. The stem pierces his lower back and emerges from his throat. Offshoots stab their way out of his ribcage and temples. In a matter of seconds, it is finished. Pink flowers bloom at the tips, the poacher's corpse suspended like some kind of grotesque puppet. Without a sound, Alaniwe emerges from the trees and walks past the camerawoman, past the poacher's body, and kneels by the elephant. He raises a hand to the creature's wound. The camerawoman waits with bated breath. He's going to heal it. She can feel it. That's Alaniwe's final power. He can save the elephant, surely. But the blood keeps flowing. The elephant's breathing grows fainter until silence fills the clearing. No birds chattering, no breeze to rustle the trees, no more death rattles, silence. Then the most heartbreaking sound the camerawoman has ever heard, 
Alaniwe starts to sob. She is no longer welcome here. This is not her place. Without a word, the camerawoman gets to her feet and walks back up the hill and out of the valley. As she walks, she hears footsteps approaching her. The presenter is there, arms laden with fruit and berries. He grins at her, explaining how he's going to take these home and plant them up. Start a smoothie chain called Alani Ways. If the first store goes well, they can franchise it, keeping the local feel but expanding to… A root stabs through his throat, interrupting him. A second stabs through his chest, shattering the hidden camera. So much for that smoothie chain. The camera woman doesn't look back. She walks through the day and the following night. She finds a road and stops. There's something in her pocket still. She takes out the SD card and looks at it. With a sad little smile, she takes the card between her fingers and snaps it clean in two. The man that you have just encountered deep in the Tanzanian wilderness may not be a man at all. Little is known about the genetic makeup of SCP-5411, otherwise known as Alaniwe. He appears to be a male, comprised of a combination of human, animal, and botanical components. The plants and pelts that the camerawoman observed him wearing are likely not items of clothing at all, but rather are naturally growing parts of Alaniwe's anatomy, giving him the appearance of a witch doctor. None of the documented attempts to communicate with Alaniwe have proved fruitful. While he does speak, his language is currently unidentified. He seems to have no understanding of English, Swahili, or Arabic, and is uninterested in learning them. Alaniwe roams freely within a 35 square kilometer area of the southern Tanzanian savanna. This site has been designated SCP-5411-0, and an exclusion zone has been set up around it. Barbed wire fences and automated drones patrol the perimeter. A sacrificial goat is kept on site at all times, ready to be sacrificed as part of a binding ritual to keep SCP-5411 contained. Thus far, however, Alaniwe has not proved to be a threat to anyone other than those who disturb the delicate ecosystem which he inhabits. His land, SCP-5411-0, is home to a number of critically endangered or near-extinct species of African animals, many of whom are from different countries in the continent. Black rhinoceros, western gorilla, African penguins, and a so-called albino ghost elephant that is central to local folklore. It is unclear how these animals came to live in this area, but there is an evident connection between Alaniwe's care of nature and their continued survival. Alaniwe has been witnessed delivering newborn animals of a number of species, tending to injured animals and even regrowing grasslands to feed and house various creatures. Alaniwe is known to possess the powers of teleportation, intangibility, zoolingualism, florokinesis, and psychokinesis. When left alone, Alaniwe uses these abilities to tend to his local ecosystem. However, he is aggressive and decisive in disposing of anything he perceives to be a threat to the natural order. He is known to manifest and control small humanoid creatures, roughly one meter tall, that are made up of foliage, wood, mud, and rocks. These creatures, designated SCP-5411-1, exhibit basic predatory behavior, carrying out the bidding of SCP-5411, such as destroying our camerawoman's equipment. Capable of running at speeds of up to 75 kilometers an hour, the 58 known instances of SCP-5411-1 are to be treated as hostile as soon as they leave the SCP-5411-0 exclusion zone. However, a status quo seems to have settled between SCP researchers and SCP-5411. Alaniwe seems content within his ecosystem, and the conservation work he carries out within this area is proving invaluable to those researching climate change and habitat welfare. Much like the animals in nature documentaries, it is best that we choose not to interfere and let nature run its course. The SCP Foundation personnel at Area 142 didn't understand what was happening. For days, researchers and guards had been complaining about headaches and nausea. Soon, the on-site water purification system broke down. A researcher experienced multiple organ failures, and the on-site hangar completely collapsed, causing the deaths of multiple airmen. What was happening at Area 142? Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1440, also known as the Old Man from Nowhere. SCP-1440 has the appearance of a human male, but its ethnicity and age are both unknown. When asked any details about itself or its past, including its name, birth date, or place of birth, SCP-1440 refuses to answer, though it's unknown if it is refusing to give this information, or if it simply does not know the answer to these questions. 
the aptly nicknamed Old Man from Nowhere, appears to be around 80 years old. But in the 50 years that the SCP Foundation has been aware of its existence, SCP-1440 has not shown any signs of aging at all, and it has yet to be determined whether it is aging too slowly for a difference to be perceived in that time, or if it does not age at all, and this is its permanent appearance. But SCP-1440's lack of aging is not even the strangest thing about it. Its true anomalous nature reveals itself once it comes into contact with the human population or any man-made objects and remains in contact with them for more than a few days. After several days of exposure, an acute adverse effect on anything and everything directly connected to humanity occurs in the vicinity of SCP-1440. Destructive events begin to happen and grow increasingly disastrous until the man-made objects are destroyed or the people in close contact are killed. The only exceptions to these destructive events are SCP-1440 itself and its few possessions, which consist of its clothes, a sack made of unidentified material, a pack of worn playing cards, and a small glass cup. It's unknown whether these objects are somehow protected from the destructive anomalous events, or whether they are not actually man-made items. SCP-1440 seems to be aware of its anomalous effects on human populations and objects, and appears to attempt to avert destruction of them by avoiding human contact as much as possible. However, SCP-1440 is for some reason compelled to travel in what looks like a highly complex pattern, one that always eventually leads to it running into human populations, whether it wants to or not. The particulars of this pattern, both its shape and the reason why SCP-1440 feels compelled to follow it, are as of yet unknown. And just like the other details of its origin, the old man from nowhere has not been able to provide any additional information or help. SCP-1440 has explained that the growing size of the human population and its expansion into previously uninhabited areas has made it harder and harder to avoid contact with humanity, as it follows its complex pattern of movement. SCP-1440 is not actively hostile, nor will it resist or fight back against attempts to contain it. Unfortunately for the SCP Foundation, all attempts to contain SCP-1440 have so far failed. These containment attempts have led to large losses of personnel life and Foundation resources as a result of the destructive anomalous effects that follow SCP-1440. The Old Man from Nowhere first came to the SCP Foundation's attention after SCP-1440 itself approached a Foundation researcher who was on her way to work. SCP-1440 somehow knew that this researcher worked for the Foundation and requested her assistance. When the researcher asked what kind of assistance it was looking for, it replied that it hoped the Foundation would be able to destroy it. It was brought to an SCP Foundation site for further questioning and study, which is where the destructive anomalous effects were first witnessed. The entire site was destroyed, killing multiple site personnel, as well as causing the destruction of six safe and Euclid-level SCP objects. So far, all other attempts to contain SCP-1440 have resulted in similar destructive events. SCP-1440 doesn't resist the SCP Foundation's attempts to contain it. During a fourth such attempt by the Foundation, SCP-1440 was brought to Area 142. The old man from nowhere applauded the Foundation's ongoing efforts, but also expressed that it was for the best that it be allowed to leave as the results for the researchers would be the same as the previous three attempts, death for all involved. SCP-1440 told the researcher interviewing it that its first brother had already arrived and was standing behind the researcher. It went on to explain that the brothers are different, but one and the same. They are all cruel, vengeful, and capable of holding a grudge for a long time. They are the cause of SCP-1440's misfortune, and therefore the cause of anyone who comes into contact with it. It then told the researcher that the second brother had arrived, and that time was running short. If it wasn't released soon, then the destruction would start. The researcher asked about the third brother, and questioned how much time they had since the third had apparently not yet arrived. SCP-1440 explained that the third, despite being the cruelest of all, never arrives, and that it's actually the appearance of the last brother that will somehow set the old man from nowhere free. 
SCP-1440 has spent countless months and years searching for the third brother, trying to return something that he won from the other two. It then made a reference to challenging death itself to a game of cards for its life, and if the researcher is ever in such a situation, they must not do what the old man from nowhere did. Win. At that very moment, the on-site nuclear device stored at Area 142 detonated. Despite it having multiple fail-safes in place that should have made such a detonation impossible, Area 142 was destroyed, and all on-site personnel were killed. SCP-1440 was spotted a week later, over 3,000 kilometers away from Area 142, showing no signs of having experienced any harm. After three additional containment attempts were made, and all ended in a similarly disastrous fashion. Future attempts to contain SCP-1440 have been suspended indefinitely, until a suitable containment procedure that doesn't involve an unacceptable loss of resources and personnel can be found. Research and analysis of SCP-1440's traveling pattern continues, with a focus on minimizing civilian exposure to it, as does research into a way to hopefully permanently contain it in the future. Unfortunately, SCP-1440's location is currently unknown, and it has been given the object class Keter. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and be sure to subscribe as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.